That's a good idea. Oh, oh this I don't, is the average. You don't throw so, a piece of so paper away in my house unless it's been breaker. used on both sides. In total is a lot. Yeah. Of I mean, you know, this no, is old. But on a so per yeah, why not? Course, I just use them all. I get to look it up in here again. Breaker. So that's that. Well. Okay, the time being 7 o'clock, I'd like to call uh, to order the Chelmsford Tax Classification Study Committee session of June, July 2nd, 2018. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome. This meeting is being recorded and televised by Chelmsford Telemedia. If there's anyone else present who's willing, who is uh, planning to record, would you please so indicate at this time? Seeing none, we will move along. Um, the first thing on the agenda is the approval of minutes of uh, the June 18th meeting. Move to approve the minutes from June 18th. Actually. If you're going to misspell my name, please oh. do so oh, consistently. Sorry. <laughs> S. Strike that S. S. No S, okay. No S. No, no, no one, S. It no S. In the body? No S. Oh, where? I will fix that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I see. In this paragraph, it's spelled right. out. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm very consistent at being inconsistent, so. Uh, that's a reasonably friendly amendment, I think. <laughs> uh, any other any other uh, corrections or additions, deletions? I just have a, a kind of a format question. Um, we have Mr. Edward, but then we have France, and we have Pichette, and we have you know this inconsistency okay. there too. I noticed when the first set of minutes you had initial and last name, which yeah. Is, do you have a preference? I think there should be something. I mean, then it would be easier. Last name it, only. Well, easier. how about initial and last name? Then you wouldn't have just Edward, maybe because Edward could also be a first name. I agree. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> uh, so can you can you yeah. make that uh, find replace? Okay. We're uh, just move for, moving forward. Yeah, and and then yeah, we'll we'll right. try to keep that format going forward. Okay. If she's going to revise these, then what we talked about beforehand in terms of, you know, the first time instead of using an acronym to spell spell out what it is, I I like it's where on the second page where we talk about reach out to EDC, and I had to sit and think about it for a while. What does EDC refer to? So, you know, if it's printed out once and then in paren, and then you can refer to EDC the rest of the minutes. There were other ones too. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? Sorry. I, I second. That. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Uh, six, six to zero to one. Thank you, Ms. Stansfield. Yes. <laughs> Wise guy. Okay. Uh, the f we're moving on to new business. The first. Uh, order of business there would be a manage, uh, town manager statement. Uh, Paul Cohen is here, and I'd like to welcome him. And thank you for taking time to come and talk to us. Good evening, and thanks for having me here this evening. Um, I'm here to uh, provide some insight and also any, answer any questions that you may have. Um, regarding the subject of tax classification, um, it's very clear in the charter that it's and in state law, this is a responsibility of the Board of Selectmen, not the town manager. Um, really, this is a policy decision of the town, and therefore, as town manager, I've sort of refrained from participation in it because clearly, as I said, that's a, a responsibility uh, of the Board of Selectmen. Um, but I know there have been some issues that have come up, and, and I, hopefully I can give you some insight in terms of my 11 and a half years of experience in the town. and. 28 years of experience uh, in municipal administration. Um, I think the first thing that's worth repeating, uh, and particularly for those who may be watching at home, because uh, I'm sure you're aware, is tax classification or the splitting of the tax rate doesn't provide any additional revenue to the town. So whether the rate is split, uniform, higher on commercial, you know, to provide relief residents, it doesn't increase the amount of funds available under Proposition 2.5 to be raised by the tax levy to operate the town. Um, so therefore, it's clearly revenue neutral. 
from from the town administration and operations exp uh, perspective. Um, and so again, you know, it it, um, it does prevent it does present an opportunity. And I always thought in the back of my mind, to be <coughs> real honest with you, that I thought the time that the town might consider splitting the tax rate was sort of in conjunction with a major debt exclusion. Um, you see, for example, in towns like Bowricker and discussions in Lowell and so forth, when a major, in most cases, the school project, because that's, that's the major expenditure by communities these days, um, they look at the impact that it has on a uh, residential home uh, owner of a certain value and certainly the business community. And so I always thought in the back of my mind that that was sort of one of the trump cards that could be pulled out saying, well, look, we have to do this major ex capital expenditure. Um, but as one way to provide some relief for the taxpayers of the community residential, that there would be a split in the rate. Um, and we're not there in Chelmsford. The day will come. As we know, we, we have, a, uh, many of you may be aware, we have a project before the Massachusetts School Building Authority looking at a school facility, um, which didn't get approved last year and likely won't be approved this year. But at some point uh, in the next decade or so, um, there will need to be a capital investment in the schools. Um, we have the unfortunate consequence, as you know, of having all the schools in the community constructed during the period of 1959 to 1974, the latest being the new high school, uh, which is now um, obviously, you know, looking at a half century mark uh, if you were to build or some type of project new. And much like what you're seeing now taking place in Tewksbury, there will ultimately be a school project of some kind um, and when you start looking at the, rev the revenue and the expenditure that's required to do such a project, I always thought in the back of my mind that that might be the, the time that Chelmsford would consider classification uh, as a way of sort of mitigating the impact. Um, but again, that will be decided in the, f in the future. Um, to, to get more on point, more contemporary, um, as you know, the Board of Selectmen, the Municipal Administration, and the community as a whole have focused on economic development, uh, increasing the commercial tax uh, base as, again, a means to provide relief for the residential uh, taxpayer in the community. Um, and again, the insight I want to give to you is that in the discussions that I've had with businesses in recent years, and I think sort of even going back over the past decade, um, taxes isn't the top of their list. Um, in terms of whether they're going to locate in Chelmsford. Quite frankly, the, the, the first thing, and it's the fundamental rule of real estate, why they're choosing to locate in Chelmsford is location. It's all about location. Um, and that's, that has a variety of, of considerations. I mean, again, we're in a very heightened economic cycle right now with prolonged period of slow growth. Um, our vacancy rate, and you'll see the data soon from the assessors when they present, it's still you know, significant. Uh, and I think the reason for that is is that we're down the corridor of Route 3. Um, the further you go from Burlington down the corridor, the further you are from the urban core. Um, and, and really, that is the determinant in terms of location, uh, in, the, in terms of where a business is going to come. Um, and, you know, you don't see the rents that you have in those areas. And, and part of it is, is in the core, the core concerns of business, you're saying, well, it's not taxes. What is the concern of business? The concern of business these days is location for a couple of reasons. One is they want to retain and attract key talent. Uh, and the millennials or the newer workforce, they tend to be ur urban oriented. Uh, obviously, Boston being the predominant, you, you see what we've never seen in our lifetimes have transpired in the last seven years. The phenomenal growth of Boston in terms of housing and commercial development on the waterfront and so forth. Uh, that is the epicenter of what's going on here. And then you look at places like Somerville, which we all thought a decade ago was a very affordable community and so forth. You can't touch that now. Um, and Cambridge, certainly, you know, it goes without mention uh, and so forth. And then, like I said, it comes out into an urban corridor that goes out to the Waltham area, 128 belts and so forth. But it's hard. Um, our, our, you know, we, we've... Our location, we're more of a satellite of the city of Lowell, which is an urban center, than, than we are trying, you know, really attracting the businesses who are going to leave Cambridge or Boston. So that's my perspective on it. Uh, I can tell you I'm involved heavily with Middlesex 3 Coalition, which runs the corridor from Lexington to Burlington, all the way up to Tingsboro, including Westford and Tewksbury and 
Bedford and, and uh, Bilberka and so forth. Uh, and and I, I said, I see the insights of what's happening there. Um, and again, it, you just follow the length of the highway uh, in terms of what's, what's transpiring there. Um, and so again, when I look to what, what's the turning factor, part of what we don't have is we don't have a connection to commuter rail. Um, so you've got that last mile problem uh, again, about businesses locating is how are you going to get them, even if they want to reverse commute uh, from Alewife or the train station in Lowell or North Berwicker and so forth. Um, it's a challenge in Chelmsford. Um, and then, again, the we, we have a very favorable location, so I don't want to paint a, a pessimistic, pessimistic future of Chelmsford in terms of economic development, but but it is, you know, our, our services have tended to be business support services. We tend to draw our labor pool from northwest Middlesex County, southern New Hampshire. Uh, and so if you're pulling from that way, um, clearly being on this end of the bottleneck of Route 3 by 495 and certainly down by 128, uh, it, do, it does draw. And we tend to have customer support services. Kronos was obviously the clearest example of that. They are support. We have Comcast um, and, you know, UPS are our just employer in terms of the facility over there on Brick Hill Road. Um, and so when it comes down to the issue of taxes and so forth, um, businesses will ask for a tax increment financing agreement um, if it's part of their package. Um, you saw Kronos got one from Lowell. Uh, we've given them in the past a town meeting, uh, years past, um, for a Hittite and so forth. Um, and honestly, I think we will be asked that request whether or not we have a split rate. Um, it's part of the ask. Um, so I don't think that if we were to keep business rates low, that that would pre be a prevention from seeking agreements. They ask for TIFs because they can ask for TIFs. Um, there's no downside for them to ask. It really depends upon, in a community's sake, whether you want them there or not. Um, we saw this happen most recently in Wilmington. Uh, they passed their largest TIF at town meeting a few months ago um, because Analog is, is a major employer there that owns its real estate, and they're consolidating their campus and, in fact, are relocating two firms out of Chelmsford, one Lanier up, uh, Technologies out of Drum Hill, and then the Analog facility um, off of 129 Strip. Uh, and, you know, clearly the town of Wilmington, in that case, it was an unprecedented TIF, but when they looked at the long-term revenue and employment base and the, and the ancillary effects from having the business there in terms of impact in the community, the multiplier effect from business days to meals and, and travel and so forth, they granted that. Um, and so I'm convinced with that you know, some employees will seek that in Chelmsford. DCU did not seek that. Uh, they're coming in uh, probably full bore in the next month or so uh, at the old Kronos main headquarters building. What's delaying them a little bit is they, they, they're still working on their emergency generator power um, because they're running a customer service center uh, as, and, uh, and you need to have un, an uninterrupted power supply there. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think those are the fundamentals in terms of my perspective in terms of what I see from it from the town. And then in the last couple minutes, because I want to leave some time for questions or comments that you may have, I know part of your study is also to look at the exemptions. Um, and particularly the elderly exemptions. Um, and I know that was a consideration. And clearly, I think the insight is correct. If you look at the diminishing value of, of the um, exemptions over time, clearly they've lost their market significance. Um, the, and they can be adjusted for inflation. You can also adjust the number of years that an elderly person would have to be living in the community, their asset level, and so forth. The only thing I would ask you to consider, and, and again, the, the assessors can provide more detailed insight in terms of the elderly exemption, um, is what would be the impact financially? Because unlike the basic exemptions for a surviving spouse, blind, uh, and the basic elderly exemption, when, you, when the town accepts levels beyond that, um, the town absorbs 100% of that cost. And so what does that mean? Well, if you're expanding that base or the amount of the exemption, that dollar and dollar comes out of the town's levy limit, uh, and basically in the form of it goes to the overlay account. So if we're providing X number of dollars 
uh, in exemptions today and you want to expand the dollar amount, which, again, I'm not making an argument that it's not a sound rationale for doing that in terms of the impact and relief that it could provide. But, again, you, one has to bear in mind that that entire cost will be borne by the taxpayers in Chelmsford. And then what, is, what that means being under the levy limit, it means it will be that much less money to provide for other municipal services. Um, and so that's, that's the trade-off. Um, so that one does actually have an impact on the budget. It's not revenue neutral. If you increase the amount of exemptions available in terms of dollar amount, um, then the town has to absorb that. It's no different, quite frankly, than the senior work-off program. We've been very generous and aggressive. In fact, we I think we provide as much senior work off, um, clearly more so than Tewksbury, more, um, more than Berwicka, more than Westford, and similar to what Lowell provides is a, in a dollar amount. Uh, and if we, again, if we're going to expand that in terms of either the amount that people could earn under that program and or the amount of funding under that program, it has the same impact. Um, and so even though we're not at the statutory limit under that program, it's the same rationale. And why, why does that matter? Well, we've seen what's happened in the last four years, and it looks like it'll probably continue for the next four years. We are at a situation in terms of the local economy that we're really not receiving significant support and in, in, in local aid uh, from the state. Um, you can see the numbers clearly. Anyone looks at the, the Chapter 70 education funding or general government uh, relief, you know, if the, if the state's providing $150,000 a year in additional educational funding and our budget in schools is growing by $2 million a year, you can clearly see how that gets disproportionately out of whack and, and continues to grow over time. And as I say, there doesn't seem to be any indication that that's going to change. You just may have read about the grand bargain at the state house between saving the sales tax, you know, upping the minimum wage and providing paid leave. Well, none of that provides any additional revenue to the Commonwealth, and then they threw out the millionaire's surcharge. And again, whether that was a good idea or not doesn't matter. The bottom line is there's no appetite out there um, to provide additional revenue. Um, and so the concern I have is we're at the end of what's sort of an unprecedented economic run, even though it's been a slow run um, of about a decade. Um, sooner or later, we're going to hit a downturn in the economy. Um, and the question is, is you know, how, how do we weather that? Um, we are at levy limit, folks. Um, you heard this at town meeting in the spring when we had to deal with some budgetary challenges, and you'll hear it at fall town meeting, although probably not as much because it looks like the final two collective bargaining agreements will not be resolved by October 15th uh, town meeting. But we are at the levy limit. Um, and um, so, again, you know, we're, we're all in support of economic development. Um, but it's, it's, it's a challenge, and, and, and again, there's no wrong answer for the work that you're doing. It's just, a, it, and in the end, it's going to be a judgment call. Um, I can tell you this, one last closing insight. I'm convinced that no matter what the tax levy or average single-family tax bill is for a business or a resident, that it'll always be too much. <laughs> that, if, that, if, that if the average tax bill in Chelmsford was $4,500, people would say it's too much. And given that it's, you know, Close to seven thousand dollars, they say it's too much, and clearly, if it was nine thousand dollars, it's too much because you know you're going to hit that statutory ten thousand dollar limit under the tax reform law. That's when it's really too much. Um, but, and so, and I think the other part, the closing comment that I want to provide to you is the implementation is tricky, and I've mentioned this to the members, some members of the board of selectmen. Remember, we bill quarterly, and the first two halves of the tax bill are estimated bills, which basically a quarter of the previous year. That first year of implementation, you're going to have the 100% impact of splitting the rate over 50% of the fiscal year. So if, if there is a rate split, that means that impact is going to be double what it would be over four quarters over the second half of the year in terms of an increase for the, if you split the rate. And also the tax relief for the residents is going to be double as well um, if, you re, if you reduce the residential burden. And then what that likely means is You'll have the rate, let's say if you're a residential bill payer, your rate will, will dip, but then it's likely going to increase, depending upon the amount of the split as you phase in, the following year because you now have to, you're sort of mitigating that half year increase over a quarter, and then you get the regular increase in the levy by 2.5%. Um, and so I'm convinced that within a year or two, people would be, again, going back saying, where's my tax relief? My taxes went back up. And that did happen one year. We had a year about seven or eight years ago where the average single family tax bill went down slightly 
Um, nobody remembered that. And then when I went back up again, it increased. So, so anyway, those are my insights. I know you've got a busy agenda, so I'm going to stop myself here at 20 after because I, I know you sort of allocated 30 minutes, so I'll, I'll pause right here. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, questions? Yeah. yeah. Paul, I, and I'm trying to go through all this stuff and the section on exemptions. Does the state reimburse for some of those or actually cover some of those exemptions? Yes, yes. If you look on our cherry sheet in terms of cherry sheet okay. reimbursements, we actually do receive reimbursement for the statutory exemptions. Okay. But when the town does a local option exemption, when, so, there's yeah. nothing. And I, I did. I think that's where I caught it. Then, yep. so some of these limits you can change by local option, but then you, that's what you're saying. You cover the, the the difference. Right. So the approach might be to try to get the state to come up with some more realistic numbers yep. rather than do it local option. But good luck with that. Good luck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Other questions. I'm not sure if this pertains to this or not, but you said something. You said something about the um, go, the arbitration. We mm -hmm. haven't gotten that way. Okay. Yeah. The Supreme Court hearing that yes. the decision that came on, down on, on, age, on agency fee. Yes. Right. Yeah. Does that hit Massachusetts? I know it hits some states, but so, if it hits Massachusetts, does that mean that we won't have to go into arbitration from the no. way I read that? No, no, the arbitration is, is, it remains. What, what it comes down to is, is it was right to work states and, and the idea of agency fee, meaning in Massachusetts, you, you, you're not compelled to join the union, but whether you join the union or not, you're going to have an agency fee taken out. If you don't join the union dues, your agency fee is taken out of your, of your pay every week anyway. Uh, and we actually do have some employees in the library union and in the school union uh, who actually decided they didn't want to join the union, but they have a dues deduction. And what the Supreme Court uh, of the United States ruled was that was unconstitutional, that you it violated their free speech because often those funds were used for political purposes and so forth. The reaction in Massachusetts the day that was announced uh, last Wednesday was, we'll get a legislative fix in to the best we can by the end of the July session, which right now is less than, what, 28 days away, to sort of address the impacts that that may have in Massachusetts. Now, clearly, they can't override the U.S. Supreme Court, but they're, they're all thinking now of, of something that they're going to, to do um, to address the potential loss of revenue that would happen by the free rider system. So in other words, you're governed by a collective bargaining agreement, but whether you would be a member of the union or not, you still you get what, you know the tragedy of the commons, the free rider approach. You would get those benefits without paying, and therefore every individual would may elect not to pay, and therefore the revenue base would diminish from the union. Um, so we're we're all anxious to see what what comes out in the next four weeks uh, from the legislature in terms of that issue. Uh, it's not clear at this time what that is, other than they can't override the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, so it's be interesting to see what 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 is devised over the next few weeks. Okay, thank you for that clarification. At the um, most recent tax classification hearing last fall, yeah. uh, I believe it was a member of the Board of Selectmen, not one in present, who said there was, uh, cited a statistic that like 17 percent of households in Chelmsford ha currently have children in the school system. Is that roughly the those are the numbers I've seen. I, I can't tell you that I have hard data that shows it that. Sounds, but it's, roughly, it's in the yeah, ballpark. It's in the ballpark, okay. yeah, roughly 20 Okay. Now, ignoring education and just focusing on other services that are provided by the town, for example, public safety and public health, do you see any evidence that there's a wide disparity between the usage of town services between commercial and residential? Well, clearly... Commercial doesn't use the schools, which you've said aside from that. We don't provide um, solid waste and recycling collection to commercial uh, businesses and now not to uh, rental uh, housing units above four units. Um, so those are two biggies. I mean, again, they all draw upon public safety. I don't think there's a disproportionate share of public safety. Most of your public safety calls t tend to be in residential homes. They generally happen at night. Um, when people are people are home in the community, um, public works is the universal one. You know, we're we're we're, provi we're providing roadways, uh, traffic signals, um, 
and and obviously the other ancillary services of government are based on fees. Um, you know, um, you know, sewer is based on a sewer charge. You know, water, as we know, is a separate independent district. Um, so those are sort of taken out of the equation. Uh, and then the general government municipal services, um, you know, are, are sort of the support basis. Yeah, we assess property, we collect property. Those aren't disproportionate. And then your other services tend to be residentially based in terms of your library, senior center. Um, so no, I, I don't think one can make the argument that businesses, in fact, one could argue that, and probably should argue that businesses bear less of the, of the burden on town services even aside from education. Um, with respect to education, I wasn't actually going to bring it up, but I would suggest the Board of Selectmen may need to form another study committee uh, if people continue to claim that the business community, the commercial community, does not use the school system. That would seem to mean they don't hire people who come through the Chelmsford school system. So they, they certainly benefit from our school system, and one could argue they benefit more than the roughly 83% of households who do not have children in the school system. Yeah, I mean, that's a sticky one. Um, it is. Yeah, I mean, clearly Market Basket, you know, is an employer probably of many people who use the Chelmsford school system uh, since they tend to uh, utilize a young population of school age and young adults. Um, but I'm not so sure that if we went down to Endeavor Robotics, that their employment base is driven from Chelmsford. Um, and so I think that's, like I said, I think it's, it, you know, you've, like most things, it's not a uniform data set that we're looking at. We're, you know, we're looking at businesses who are running, you know, um, uh, a coffee shop, you know, at the corner of Chelmsford Street versus UPS, um, you know, who's, who's running a, you know, transportation service to restaurants and everything in between. I mean, cl clearly nobody's going to argue that um, businesses don't benefit from the educated workforce, but, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I can tell you this, I've said with the selectmen when they issue licenses for business owners in the community for new restaurants and so forth, and I can't recall the last time, actually I can, I think the last one that came before the selectmen was the yogurt, frozen yogurt place on Chelmsford Street across from Alpine Lane. My point is most of the restaurant owners that come before the board for licenses um, and tend to be from out of town. Um, the question is, well, who do they employ? My guess is it's a combination. They're, they're, employing, they're employing support staff and wait staffs and so forth that come from a variety of in-town and out-of-town services. So, no, I'm not going to sit here and say that businesses don't educate benefit from an educated workforce, but yet the society as a whole would benefit mm -hmm. from that uh, in terms of the whole issues of crime and, you know, behavior and so forth. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a whole different uh, political science and, and social science uh, argument, John. Yep. One final question on a completely different topic, sure. and if you don't know the answer to this, I bet Frank will. Sure. The, uh, the license fee for the Residents at the Chelmsford Commons, from yes. also known as the Mobile Home Park, it's yes. still ten dollars. Yes, and that's by state statute. Um, again, uh, well, by, by state statute, it can be between six and twelve. Correct. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the thing with the Mobile Home Park, just so people understand that that obviously is affordable housing to the community, um, and I think no one sort of wanted to take it upon it to ask two dollars more a month from a resident who's who's in a um, what, what's considered a um, lower income housing stock. Um, I think the challenge there and why it needs to be considered is, is that's not considered part of the town's subsidized affordable housing inventory uh, in terms of the whole 10% rule. And, and the reason for that is because they're not deed restricted units. Um, so clearly the town does have affordable housing units at the mobile home park and they obviously they have, they avail themselves the services of the town's education most notably and certainly the employment base in the town. But, um, yeah, it's, I think the revenue impact on that is so insignificant. I mean, we're running a $132 million budget, and I don't think we would generate much revenue, uh, and I think it would sort of leave the board a little bit uneasy, sort of saying, well, we're going we're gonna to hike these people's uh, monthly fee by 20% from $10 to 12 I mean, the $2 a month for a number of units, I just don't think is, is, is materially significant, and I think that's why it's just been left alone. I'm, I'm sure you are aware that I would not suggest going in that direction. <laughs> right, or, or, or even the other direction, but I'm just, it's, no, because we're often asked, are we, are we availing ourselves to 
all the revenue sources in the community. And, and I think Chelmsford has uh, in terms of meals tax and, uh, and the, I think the, you know, the, the, the one that's out there, but the legislature won't move on it, would be a local option gasoline checks. Um, the, you know, the, the state keeps talking about communities contributing and, and providing local projects. But so far, the legislature hasn't moved on that. So in other words, if the town wished to do a major project, or let's say the region did, let's say the region was committed to resolving the bottleneck at 495 and Route 3, and you could get, you could get Lowell, Chelmsford, you know, Bed, Berica, Tingsboro, and so forth to agree, you know, then the idea would be, well, maybe all those communities would have a, an additional three cents per gallon on gasoline, and that could pay for that project. It's been talked about, but it just, the state hasn't moved forward on that, um, and it's unclear if that will happen in the years ahead. Uh, the other problem is that we're getting other unfunded mandates in the meantime. The most notable one you'll see this fall would be the stormwater is back uh, on the table because the federal government is implementing that after a year's delay. So, you have questions? I have another one. When you get back to me. Or do you, are there questions over here? Sure. Yeah, go. Um, in relation to the TIF. That's tax incentive. What is tax the increment one? financing agreement? In other words, the, the if the business is worth ten million dollars and the, and they invest so that the value goes up to twelve million dollars, the benefit is only on the increment. So you'd get relief on the increment above the base. That's why it's called tax increment financing agreement or TIF for the ac the, the 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 acronym that she's going to put in those minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, just thought I'd help you out. Okay. You probably know already. Right. <laughs> um, well, the companies that do receive that, the money that the town does not receive from them on certain years, the commercial base picks that up. No, no. What happens is, is you get you. Let's say the let's say the increase in value is two million dollars. First of all, the, the benefit goes to the property owner, not to the business, because they may not be one and the same. But if but it go, the property owner, if the value of the underlying commercial property goes from 10 million to 12 million, that $2 million increment, it may be phased in over time. So you might get an 80% discount the first year, 50 the second year, 40, 30, 20, 10. And so basically, so your base would grow, but they would get the okay. portion of the relief over time. Right. So it only, your base only grows by what the increment is that's okay. coming in. Um, so that's how that, that's how that tax works. So it, it's meant to provide an incentive because, but for them coming, one would argue, then you wouldn't have that increase, so you're sort of sharing in the rewards of them coming to your community. But yet, if they leave, if they leave, um, <laughs> then you then you lose out. And also, if they don't adhere to the to the employment requirements or the investment requirements, the they they they, they have to refund um, oh. their their relief. So it's not unchecked. And in fact, the state's been pretty good on that in recent years in terms of making sure that the employment base that they provided as well as the tax base does in fact take place. So no, they're, 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 you, you can't go backwards, but if they were to leave or they were not to happen, that, you know, to meet their requirements, you can suspend or remove the, um, mm -hmm. the tax incentive. And just one more question. Mm -hmm. um, if we were not up to levy limit, mm -hmm. if we did not have a 2.5 increase, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm asking this for the benefit of the people that are watching the television and the understanding of the community. What services would you cut? Well, it, that's sort of the age-old question that we have every year, uh, and mm -hmm. there's no answer to that. The, the, ans the answer is, is, what, is what we did in the mid-year cuts back 10 years ago when the Great Recession transpired. Everything gets cut. Um, yeah, you know, more than half our budget goes to education, so that has to be impacted. Um, the other problem is, is you, if you can't kill your revenue base, meaning you you can't operate if you're not collecting and assessing your taxes. So you have to be able to function at a minimal, sustainable level to assess property, collect taxes. Um, and so if you look back at 10 years ago, we didn't cut people in the assessor's office or the collector's office, not because we, we, we gave them preferable treatment. It, it's because they're really, you know, they're, they're operating at the margin. There really isn't a lot there. And so you, you can't operate as a community if you can't get your property assessed and your bills out and collected. So what ends up happening is, is you end up closing fire stations. You end up not filling in vacancies and police. 
Um, you end up you know, reducing library hours. You end up uh, reducing staffing or sharing staffing in the town hall uh, and other departments. Um, so it ends up being an across the board impact. Um, and, the pro and the reason why does that happen, and that's because if you look at your fixed costs, you can't, in other words, your debt service is there. It doesn't matter what the economy or what the impact is, just like you're, you as a homeowner, if you, you know, your debt is your debt. You, you know, you've, you, that's full faith and credit of the town. That's got to be paid. Your benefits have to be paid. Those are contractual. Um, y your your um, re retirement assessments in the Middlesex County retirement system, that has to be paid. Um, when you start peeling away your fixed costs, quote unquote, there isn't a whole lot of discretionary costs remaining. Um, and so that's, that's sort of why you say, oh, you're always going to the most politically sensitive area. You're going to cut teachers and you're going to, you know, you're going to cut, you know, police and fire. Well, that's because when you remove everything else that's fixed, you know, you, you know you've got to heat the school buildings. You're not going to cut the heating bu budget in the schools. You're not going to, you're not, you know, you, you've got to plow the roads. Uh, it's a safety consideration. Um, and so that's, you know, so there isn't as much room there. So it's a long-winded way of saying, you know, if you look, and we always provide this every year at town meeting, we've not significantly added to the town's employment base over the past dozen years. Um, and that's why, for example, when you heard the discussion uh, at fo uh, last town, town meeting in April about staffing levels in public safety and public works, um, you can see we, you know, we're well below what they were 20-some-odd years ago. Even though the town's uh, population is growing, and also the demand for services is growing as the community ages, um, so it, it's it's a it's a it's a big challenge. Um, so it, there's really no, and you know, vocational school assessments there whether or not, you know, you can't you can't reduce your vocational school assessment mm -hmm. in a tough time either. So, thank you. And just to follow up on the TIF to make sure I understand, I've sort of always had in my mind. You gave the example somebody had a. Ten million dollar building, they were going to improve to twelve million. That, that what the TIF is would be reduced taxes on that additional two million. Exactly. But you're saying the the actual assessment only goes up that percentage each year. No, if you if you have if you so, have part so of your TIF agreement, it depends on how you structure the TIF agreement, yeah. in terms of the duration and the amount of relief you're providing. Um, it, you can go obviously from zero to a hundred percent, and so what what amount of that increment are you sharing with the employer? Uh, I, I, I guess I, what I'm trying to get at is, is, does the value of that building mm -hmm. go up to $12 million oh, yes. right away? So therefore, for the levy, you, that, that $2 million becomes new growth. It becomes part of, of what you can levy taxes on. But they're only paying, like, the first year 10% of that additional amount so who's paying the rest no, you, that, can't, you can't mind? shift you can't shift that increment to the to the residential no. payer mm -hmm. it's only that the increase is only what's allowed under the tiff agreement so you can't you can't so the increase in the, the growth in in the new growth for that year is only <coughs> what's allowed and that's what i'm trying yeah, to get yeah, at. it's only what's allowed under the tiff the terms of the TIF are negotiated in terms of length of time. Yeah, I yeah, it place, yeah. It's, So it's, uh, what's set forth immediately is what kind of, uh, what's the scale of the job that's going to be added. Again, $2 million plus the, the workforce. So it's, it's the first year the, is the greatest savings realized by the, home, by the property right. owner. And it's that first year, and then incrementally over the 20 years, the, 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 the assessment goes up and the, and the part of the new growth okay. has increased. Okay, I mean, I, that's, that's what I was, was trying to get in my mind. It's not just the amount of taxes they paid. It's actually the actual, and they're paying less taxes because their assessment's not going up the full $2 million in the first year. It's going up by whatever the percentage is <coughs> you've agreed on. Okay. Yeah. That's what I needed to clarify. Thank you. Uh, Dan, any questions? No. Okay. Helen? <coughs> <coughs> this is a sore subject, and I'm sorry, but I, I need to understand it a little better. Because you said about the businesses where they, you know, they don't get very many bennies from the town. How many condominiums in this town do we have are over 55, like Meadowwood and Windermere, where we're not only paying the water bills, but we're paying for our grinder pumps, we're paying for our roads, we're paying for our plowing, and the only thing we do get besides the town hall is the fire, the police, the library. 
and senior one center. other thing. Senior center. Oh. Senior center, okay. But what else is there? There was one other thing that I, was, <laughs> no, I didn't what, think what, about the what senior else is center. There in the town that we but, provide. <laughs> but we don't get all of those yet. Our taxes are exorbitant. Mm -hmm. um, you can come in my house. It's not a mansion, but but my question is, what is the difference between those condominiums and a business? They don't get this. We don't have kids. Mm -hmm. You know, where? What's the difference? Tell me. Is there any difference? Well, one's a commercial. I don't mean to be flip, but one's a commercial venue. One's a residential home. You can make the same argument if you were 28 years old and had no children. You could say, well, what am I getting from this community? I'm not sending my kids to the schools. And I'm not using the I'm playgrounds. Not, I'm no, not, not, not using I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I'm just trying to say. No, me either. Wh I'm just trying one is, to whether one is in 55-plus housing or, or, or one is uh, 35 years old and has no children, you may, in, and you live in an apartment at Scotty Hall or a condo at Scotty Hall or, or an apartment that's being built over at uh, Mill Road right now, you may say, I get nothing out of the community. I just come in, li live here at night, I go to work in the morning, and then the weekends I go vacation or mountains or whatever. I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, don't I know guess how I didn't ask my question yeah. properly. Yeah, okay. I was wondering, maybe Frank knows, yeah. on all the condominiums that we have in town, mm -hmm. how many of them get plowing, get don't have grinder pumps, don't have, um, get the roads paved. How many of them do the, any of them? Because I think some do. That's what I'm trying to get is, is there a difference? Over 55 communities we're talking about get the exact same services that any other condominium complex would get in terms of the plowing in, on the interior, which is somewhat limited. Uh, as Paul referenced, the other services are, are the same, whether it's an over 55 or not. What we do see with the over 55, and I think we kind of talked about this a couple of weeks ago, yeah, we is did. particularly your complex, yeah. to be perfectly honest with you, is held its value yeah. stronger than anything. And, I, and I, as I said at that time, your complex, when we were having the downturn in the residential real estate side, that was the only complex that held its value. It was that over 55 Windermere section. There was no other complex in town that uh, performed as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm getting back to the over 55, they have the, the they get access to the same services that any other complex gets and gets the same um, in terms of infrastructure with uh, plowing and the like. They're uh, treated identically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Paul, I just have a couple of quick ones. Um, do you foresee any special difficulties or hardships to the town if uh, a split rate were to be implemented? In terms of execution, would it be additional workload? Would there be any particular problems with that? Well, I think the particular problem would be the first year, as I mentioned, and not so much about the impact. It, it's the work that's going to be required in the assessor's office. If you split the rate and move the exemptions, that, that's work for, for these folks. Um, we are, we've always been accustomed to this issue of, oh, we'll, we'll approve the, we'll, we'll hold the hearing in November and we'll approve the rate on you know, the first meeting in December. That's, they can answer better than I will, but that's not sufficient time because they've got, now got to go into that file. Um, and with the, you know, 15,000 properties roughly around right. there that they're dealing with, it, it's just not, oh, go in and just, you know, have this rate to that rate. You know, if you're, if you're going into there and providing a split rate and doing some exemptions for, you know, the first million dollars or small business and so forth, you've got to provide them with the time to do the work. And so my, my feeling would be if, if this is going to take place in any year, I think you have that hearing, you, you open the hearing the first night after this fall town meeting uh, ends. So let's say this year town meeting is the 15th of October. Let's say it goes on to the 22nd because it goes three sessions. Then I'd have the hearing the next Monday evening, let's say the 29th of October. Then if you're going to do a two-week carryover, you're probably mid-November. And then at least gives them about six weeks to get the file updated and sent to the printers and bills out. I think that's probably the realistic schedule. Um, so my concern is time. And, and I recognize that the short time frame that you're on, if the goal is to get a report in time for the selectmen to, for consideration at this year's uh, classification hearing, I think you really need to have your work done by fall town meeting. You yeah. have to have that, that's what it sounds like. If, if, by mid-October. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, la one last thing. Uh, if somebody is looking to apply for an exemption, mm -hmm. is there a single point of contact for yeah, them? Yeah, the assessor's office. office. Everything, okay. you know, we'll yeah, Fine. everything goes to the assessor's office, and uh, that's that's your point of information. Okay.
Okay. Thank you very Great. much. Thank Paul. you. It was nice talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> okay. Next up, uh, we have the most uh, the the man with the most job security in town. I guess <laughs> I could say. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Green to uh, to go over some of the some of the uh, available exemptions and their implications. Absolutely. First, I want to start with the, the the front end of that and say that the you would ask about the dates uh, for applying for some of these exemptions. Um, anytime after July first, so really over the last couple of days, begins the uh, the application process for signing up for the uh, personal exemptions, the statutory exemptions. That goes through basically till the end of March. It's really uh, a nine month. Uh, time frame that folks can apply for any of these exemptions. Um, what we do is we include, um, uh, my boss calls them buck slips. They're about the size of a dollar. We put them in each of the bills in generally brightly colored stock, explaining um, uh, what's available uh, in very basic terms, the, the, the guidelines uh, that they fall under, and, and the dates and the ages and that sort of thing. So we try and get the word out there. It's also on the, um, on the town website as well as um, uh, local access TV. Uh, we do offer a number of exemptions. Uh, most prominent is the, the elderly exemption. It's uh, $500 a year. It's called the 41C. Uh, some of the requirements are uh, that you be 65 years or, or older, um, as of, uh, in this case, January 1st, 2018. Uh, annual gross income cannot exceed 26000 roughly, if single, or 39500 if married. Uh, this includes Social Security, pensions, bank interest, annuities, and the like. Uh, whole estate, including, uh, not including the value of the home, once again, if single, uh, estate cannot exceed $40,000. If married, $55,000. Um, with that, it's, uh, again, $500 off. And that's some, one of the things that uh, Paul was kind of addressing. Uh, what could we do with that? And I think um, Selectman Diggs kind of was referencing that one time. $500 was a relatively substantial amount of an overall bill of maybe $1,500 or $2,000. As we stand here today, it's roughly $7,000. That $500 is certainly appreciated by anybody who's receiving it, but increasingly having less of an impact. The next is, a, uh, we call it, it's called the 17D. Uh, it's a surviving spouse or a minor child. This is a little more modest. This is a, if somebody's applied for the prior uh, exemption that I just reviewed, and they didn't quite make it for one reason or another. This is another one that's kind of a fallback. It's only $175. A person uh, 75 years or older, basically can get it um, uh, with $40,000 from the preceding year. So it's a little more liberal in some respects. Um, I'm going to go into some of those in greater detail in a moment. Next are the, are the veterans exemption, which are numerous, frankly too numerous to, to really review here. Uh, ultimately, it goes through Regina Jackson, the veterans agent. She processes much of that, brings them over to my office, and then we, uh, we process it. We probably have more veterans exemptions than any other type of exemption. And once the veteran has um, uh, filled it out, applied, all he or she has to do each year is come in and sign for it. It has to do with uh, the level of disability with uh, service-connected injuries, and it's somewhat tiered and stratified. But once they've applied for it, they also have that nine-month time frame. Anytime after July 1st, come in, we pull the card, they sign it. Um, if it's difficult for them to get to us or any of these folks who uh, apply annually, we, we find a way to uh, make it a little bit easier for them. We also have an exemption for... Can I um, interrupt? They're, those are veterans who have a disability. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, what we require from them are letters um, from the, uh, the veterans. Okay. Uh, blind persons, those who are uh, legally blind, uh, as issued by the Commissioner of the Blind, uh, they come in too and get $500 off each year. Um, we require, for, require from them a, um, a statement from the Commissioner of the Blind. Why that's an annual submission, I'm not too sure because... Generally, after somebody's blind, they don't uh, regain their sight, but it isn't required annually. Um, another one is the hardship exemption. This is also known as a Clause 18. Um, it is, as the term kind of suggests, um, if, if some hardship should befall somebody, uh, there aren't a lot of parameters on it. All it says is um, that they be aged, whatever that means, um, somewhat in, may possibly infirmed, or have some uh, medical issue that has um, of a kind of a catastrophic nature. Uh, the board would review that application along with anything they submit. Uh, almost always we have them meet with us to kind of, um, uh, kind of expand on their application and then a decision is made. Tax deferral is um, 
not controversial, <coughs> but some people embrace it, and it's been a godsend for them. Uh, some people are somewhat concerned about it. Tax deferral has been compared um, to a reverse mortgage in some sense. Um, the requirement is that you be 65 years or older by uh, July 1st, 2018, that your gross income from all sources not exceed $40,000 from the preceding year. Uh, as the, the name deferral suggests, your, your tax is deferred. They're deferred until the um, home is sold someday, uh, whether it's uh, if somebody should pass away and ultimately um, the house is sold or just um, they move. Then those back taxes would be paid. There is a, um, an interest on that. Uh, the town is allowed to charge anything from 0 to 8%, I believe, is the cap. And we've had 8% for quite a few years of uh, simple interest. Um, we have about 15 to 20 people that participate in this. Town, we just saw the stat recently. Statewide, there's only about 1,000 people that participate in the deferral. Um, it's probably one of the most um, underutilized exemptions that we have in terms of being able to really provide uh, sort of life-altering, life um, financially altering uh, relief. Somebody's paying six or seven thousand dollars a year, they, they wouldn't have, simply not have to pay it um, f for as long as it doesn't uh, equate to 50 percent of the value of their home. Uh, like, like I said, we have about 15 or 20 that participate in it. Uh, annually, we send out to them, just so they're aware, um, what their balance is, uh, the outstanding balance. Uh, there was a case, I think it was written up in the Globe somewhat recently, of, of a gentleman who was, uh, I don't quite grasp at all, but he, he, he inherited the home, his mother passed, uh, God bless her, at 106 years old, and had entered into a deferral when she was 76, not telling anybody about it. Uh, so she was in it for quite some time. And, and Sharon, not unlike Chelmsford, said it doesn't take long to um, accumulate tens of thousands of dollars. So he inherited the home. <coughs> and normally when somebody inherits a home as a result of a death, the house is um, ultimately transfers, but that wasn't the case here. He kept it, rented it, was unaware. So frankly, the meter was running. Um, so it was the interest that really got him at the end. Um, what we do is we send out letters to everybody each and every year, letting the folks know um, what, it, what the level is up to, because it's easy to kind of lose track of it. Um, <clears throat> what I don't know is if the child of, of somebody who's in a deferral comes in and asks about it, um, would we be legally able to, you know, disclose that kind of information? There are some privacy issues, I think, that the uh, homeowner is entitled to. So we encourage them to um, have, if not representation, at least some of their children come in and also be uh, very much aware of what's going on. Uh, I think you're mostly familiar with the Community Preservation Act, somewhat more of a, of a modest exemption. If they qualify, they can get the... Um, a CPA removed from their uh, from their tax liability. The average bill, I think, at this point is only sixty or seventy dollars a year, uh, but it is something. Uh, the other one that's um, not a um, town of Chelmsford exemption or statutory exemption in, that, in any sense. It's a senior circuit breaker, and uh, that's really a, a tax credit uh, that the uh, when you have your state income taxes um, done each year, the person could be up to I think this past year was a thousand dollars tax credit. Um, the guidelines are the taxpayer's total income cannot exceed $57,000 if a single filer, $71,000 if head of household, and $86,000 for taxpayers filed jointly. So you can see the guidelines on that are, are, are pretty liberal and pretty, um, pretty generous when considering it's $1,000. If somebody's um, applying for it for the first time and they realize that they uh, were going, with their, going over it with their preparer, that they would have uh, qualified in the years past, there is a look, look back provision of two or three years in which they could capture potentially three or four thousand dollars worth of uh, tax credits. Um, that's a review of what we offer. I'm going to uh, fast some of these uh, next pages that I had sent to you go into um, quite a bit of detail of what the guidelines are, but, uh, but I've described them uh, fairly well. In go over to the next page where it says table two. Uh, where we offer what's allowed now, what else can we do? Uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, the Board of Selectmen in, did increase uh, several of the guidelines that really opened it up for more people to qualify, particularly increasing the, um, the amount that was allowed in both income and assets up to twenty dollars and $40,000, which we increase each year uh, given uh, uh, HUD allowances. The other thing they decreased was the age requirement from uh, 70 to 65. Uh, this allowed more people to get to have access to these exemptions. It remained at $500. Uh, what is allowed is increasing it up to um, 
up to $1,000. There's even some provisions that allow you to go even more than that. As Paul alluded to, uh, we're, we're basically, each and every year, I suppose, reimbursed as much as we're going to. Nothing, uh, any more uh, submissions, which we uh, send into the DOR each year, telling them how many people that uh, have applied and the amount exempted. Uh, the reimbursement is the reimbursement. We're not, uh, uh, we certainly wouldn't be getting anything more back. Um, there are some other exemptions. As I said, most of these we've adopted. Some of them we can increase uh, the amount that um, is, is uh, the benefit. Um, there's another one towards the bottom of that first page, exempts the value of improvements to residential properties made to provide housing for persons 60 years or older. Um, let's see. So that would be like adding an in-law apartment? In-law, exactly. Right. Um, uh, there's another one that's uh, a couple of towns, only two or three towns have adopted, I believe. It's on the last page there. It exempts seniors of up to uh, the, the amount of the circuit breaker, and I reference the circuit breaker because the guidelines on that are so liberal in terms of the, um, the income allowances. Uh, there is some, some bill going through the legislature where it's, it's meandering through there now that would allow uh, towns to be a little bit more expansive in some of the uh, exemptions that we offer. But right now they're not law. Uh, there is another exemption here. It increases all personal exemption amounts by up to a percentage not to exceed 100% as voted on by the legislative body before July 1st of the fiscal year. So that's, um, once again, adding to the exemptions um, uh, pretty generously. Um, that's, I know. But you're saying if we adopt any of these things, then that's on the town rather than the that's state right. paying for them. That's right. And that's true, any local option. That's right? correct. Yep. And so we currently, you said we have increased some of the, the age or lower age limits increased or? That's right. 10 or 12 years ago, I think a little while ago, because I think Bill Dalton was on the board at the time, uh, we dropped it from 70 to 65. And then the, um, the I, I can't recall the exact um, increase with the um, income in the asset uh, um, allowances were, but it was a fairly generous uh, tool that pulled in quite a few more people. Um, one of the things we, we kind of talked about, if we did add to these, try to get a sense of, um, I think Mike and I talked about this a little bit, what would this be exposure, for lack of a better term, the exposure for the town be? Uh, it, it's fairly, we, we exempt about $300,000 a year uh, right now. Uh, so the increase, we would have more people applying for it, I would think. So the, the increase or the exposure to the town wouldn't just be the amount that we add to it. Suppose it goes from 500 to 1,000. My, my guess is that uh, more people would apply that uh, in the past have been somewhat reluctant to apply, apply for various reasons. $1,000, $1,500 um, might pique their interest. So, so the state age is 70. We've adopted a 65. So all those people who get this exemption who are between 65 and 70, we cover in the town. Right. And the state provides reimbursement for those 70 and over, is that correct? No, it's, um, it's universal. In other words, when we dropped it to 65, more people applied, it was just all part of the pool. So we get nothing from the nothing state Nothing in addition, no. As a, as a, it's a good question. As a result of increasing those, did we get more? And the answer is no. It just simply was a greater cost to the town at the time. It was a cost to the town that we wouldn't have if we didn't, hadn't lowered the age, is right. what you said, okay. And the other that, consideration... That all of that comes out of the overlay account. It does. Okay. Other questions? Are, are you, is this a good time for questions? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I just have one about the senior circuit breaker. That's a little bit different category. It right? is. That, That's really a tax credit, having nothing to do with Chelmsford so much, other than uh, to qualify for that, you pull in some uh, assessment information. But the tax credit is when you file uh, uh, state income taxes. So we could encourage additional participation in that. I would, without, I would strongly any, encourage. Uh, with, yeah, without any uh, uh, deficit for the town. That's correct. What's even better, like I said, is, is a look back provision for that. If somebody's uh, working with the tax preparer and realizes they would have kept the tax preparer in reviewing their past taxes, realized they would have qualified two, three years prior too, there is a provision to go and capture those, uh, that tax credit. And I, would, I bring it up to people often who... Um, and in particular, who have not historically over the last number of years filed taxes because they didn't, they didn't make enough money. Uh, this tax credit in and of <coughs> itself is worth filing, going to the, even if the expense of uh, filing, to the extent there is one, it's worth it to capture potentially $1,000. And just so you know, one of our, our, our former state senator used to be so proud of the fact that the town of Chelmsford had the highest per capita 
uh, participation in that in that. That's program. correct. Steve Flint continually uh, lets me. Yeah, more than any other, um, more than anybody else in the in the yeah, so, so residents of Chelsea know about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I wonder if that's not uh, that may be beyond the purview of this uh, oh, I agree. Of, of this document, but um, uh, encouraging uh, additional outreach on something like that might be a way to talk about mitigating senior, at least senior uh, taxes. This this becomes a credit to people. They get a check from the state if they don't have to pay taxes. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. I think that needs, again, I, I, I can remember being talked about in the past, but I think a greater emphasis on that for people would be extremely valuable. We include it in any of the... Um, handouts that we have when we we have some lengthy handouts that go into great detail about these exemptions then we have very brief ones and I'm pretty sure even on the brief ones we make make note of the fact that the senior circuit break is available I had always thought that um, anybody who's preparing somebody's taxes and using a, uh, a program it would come up right away once the 65 it would just surface right away and I, I hope that's the case you know it just like you know turbo tax it somebody's doing it even at home the second you put in your age and maybe even income um, it should pop right up and ask some other questions because it does pull in assessment information. Do you have? It does. Sorry. I heard what oh. you just said. I heard if they, there's neighbors of mine who have it pop up on their turbo tax when they're Good. doing their own taxes. Yeah. Uh, do you have numbers uh, over the last you know 10 years or so for the amount of? Uh, uh, of money that's gone to the senior work program, I'm not able to find that online anymore. I can get that to you. Last five years, okay? Yeah, let's start with the last five <laughs> and see if it see if it shows anything. Okay. In particular, I think we had some changes with that too in terms of the amount changed. So there was one year right. where you see it'll be a, a bump. There should be a bump, right? I mean, okay. Um, and do you track recapture of the senior def tax deferrals? Oh yes. Okay, are we at something like a steady state at this point? Is yes. uh, so so we've had the program's been around long enough that people have begun to transfer their estates for whatever reason, um, and so that while we're giving a, while we're giving some um, well, I guess while we're deferring some revenue now, this, the some there's been enough that was deferred in the past that's coming in that we sh we're not expecting to see sharp up or down movements no I would expect that number to be uh, to be relatively stable um, other than the fact and I don't know I don't really get into the, too much of the demographics but my understanding is it helps with somewhat of a grayer town yeah. and that uh, if we're at I don't know once again Steve Flynn he's my my resource for these types of things uh, he's saying that within the next five years or something we could be up to 30 percent uh, uh, you know, of elderly people, and to, so to that extent, they would qualify. We'd have that much more. But you're, you're right, Mike. Every year or two, we have uh, a couple payoffs. Okay, um, you're right, and they come all at once, right? It's when oh, yes. when the estate transfers. Yes, um, there can be a bit of a lag there, but that's where my uh, the collector of taxes comes in handy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. But then you really can't forecast that at all. No. Uh, uh, some people take it upon themselves to pay off a year for whatever reason they realize a windfall and they, you mm. know, decide to pay. Or the kids often, not often, but occasionally uh, will want to pay off some of it if possible. Um, or then all of a sudden, frankly, the, um, the owner passes away and then it's, it's probated. And then we get that. But even if, the, even if an owner decided to transfer title to their kids, just kind of estate planning, um, then it would be that transfer that, that kicks off the repayment. Potentially, repayment. they could put it into a life estate. And if they put it into a life estate, that sort of separates two types of ownership. There's the present worth of the present ownership, um, which is the, the elderly person who's living there with the understanding that it goes to the, uh, the, the, the children in this case. So and that happens immediately upon death uh, without really having to go through uh, probate. Even in that scenario, in a life estate scenario, uh, the people would still be able to get this benefit in any of these other exemptions okay. as well. Oh, okay. Even if they're in a nursing home. If somebody's in a nursing home, uh, they still are eligible for these exemptions. The idea being uh, what, they, what, what the state has looked to, the way they phrase it is, where's the most likely place you were going to return upon coming out of? And if, as long as it's identified as, as, as this home, it's okay. qualified. Yeah. John? Yeah, if I may, I'd like to go back to a couple of the exemptions that we talked about last week. Um, with regard to the small commercial exemption, um, my calculations show, you can verify if this sounds right to you, 
is that if we implemented the small commercial exemption, unless we had a split tax rate of at least 1.10, the small commercial properties would actually be paying a lower tax than comparably valued residential properties. Does that sound about yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it's another. You should mention that actually, because right. just to jump around a little bit, I had a conversation with Paul Plouffe, the assessor from, from Westwood. Thank you for bringing it up. As a matter of fact, I want to expand on my conversation with him. But he brought that up as well, because they have a small commercial exemption without a split tax rate. And he, he, he drew that line that you just drew, comparing a, uh, a similarly assessed or exactly assessed commercial property enjoying the benefit of a small commercial exemption versus a residential property. Yeah, actually, now that you mentioned that, um, after thinking about that, I was actually looking at the minutes from the meetings from the Westford Study Committee. And although you can't really tell what's going on, it sounds like they may be seriously considering dropping that small commercial. I don't want to speak out of school, but my conversation with Paul, what I was asking Paul to do, was potentially come out here and maybe uh, speak to this to this committee. Um, they are further along. They're just a couple of weeks away from finalizing and, pre and presenting before the board, maybe within the next couple of weeks. So we I talked to Paul for a while, and he said uh, he suggested why don't we wait till we present our stuff to that to the board of selectmen then he can come out and potentially the chair of the committee can come out and address this committee great yeah great um uh, another potential distortion with the uh, small commercial exemption i think this is an obvious one but i think it needs to be mentioned um if we implement the small commercial exemption and then you have a property that's a little bit over a million dollars or a little bit over 10 we could have a situation where a slightly larger property, slightly larger employment base, ends up paying quite a bit more in taxes than the so-called small. Just want to raise that issue. With respect to the residential exemption, as discussed at the last meeting, our rental properties, rental apartments, their tax liability would go up with a residential exemption. The thing I'm I guess a little bit confused about now. Maybe you can clarify for everyone with respect to one particular property in town called Chelmsford Commons, the mobile home park. The status of that property with respect to how they're taxed and what impact both a residential exemption and a split tax rate would have on that property. Chelmsford Mobile Home Park, along with several other properties, uh, usually a little more modestly assessed, are what we call mixed use. They have both a residential component and a com commercial component. Uh, in a split rate scenario, they would be taxed at two separate rates. Um, Chelmsford Mobile Home is, a, is one of those mixed use properties, uh, predominantly um, uh, residential. Uh, this goes along, with this, well, it's not mixed use, it's also worth mentioning, because Evan has brought this up in the past, that why is it that some properties that into everybody's mind, intuitively you think of as being commercial or in fact residential, and that would be the larger investment grade apartment buildings of 100 units, 200 units. They are residential. Uh, in a split rate scenario, they would be taxed at the residential rate. Um, so he's asked, in the, you know, has it ever been discussed that they be um, handled uh, as a commercial property? And the answer is no, because they, the term uh, state use code is just that, it, it's the use of the building. They are valued I almost identically as a commercial property, that it's a uh, greater weight is given to the income approach, uh, weight is given to the sales approach. They are, they are valued in terms of methodology, similarly as a commercial industrial property of similar value, uh, except when it comes to multi multiplying it by a tax rate. But those, uh, even though they're counted as residential units, they would not be, um, uh, they would not be in line for a residential exemption, right? Yeah. Almost so, by ver because it's certainly, almost certainly the owner doesn't come from Chelmsford. But even so, they'd be right. well over. So no, they would not be in line. So you might. So if you, if you were concerned about them getting the benefit of a of a residential commercial need not split, be. <laughs> then you could uh, you could also use a residential exemption to kind of keep them yes. where they are. Yes. Okay. Just a, I guess a question about that. If, if you, what we're what we're getting into here are some, fa you know, fairly complex strategies for trying to balance different classes against each other, um, is a month enough? Yeah, I mean, if the board of selectmen takes a series of votes and the upshot of it is we want a small commercial exemption and a residential exemption and a 
say, 1.10 split between the fiscal 19, I will have earned my pay. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as Paul alluded to, of the three things that we're looking at, the, the most time consuming would absolutely be the small commercial exemption. The splitting of the tax rate is a couple clicks of the mouse. That's not a big deal. Right. Uh, the residential exemption, I, uh, well, I've never executed one or administered one. From what I was looking at it, it doesn't look like it's too, uh, too tedious. The small commercial is in that, and as I described, one of the thing, the thing I have to do is identify all the parcels that have 10 or few employees. Obviously, a million dollars or less is easy enough, but the, the 10 employees or less, identify all of them. Uh, I get that list from the Department of Unemployment Assistance. That's that's part of it, but to my mind, that's the start of the um, of the research. Because in looking at it, I could, and having some feel for the town, I knew of plenty of um, of uh, parcels of commercial properties that ought to be been on that list and were not. So I know it, it's somewhat of an incomplete list, and I would want it to be as complete as possible. So I would have to identify, to the best of my ability, all of those hundreds of parcels I'm, I'm willing to bet, and then key those in manually, because uh, I have to take whatever percentage is adopted, back that off, each single one of them, and key that into the system. Uh, I, at this point, I would have to, and it couldn't even do it in my system, I have to do it in my boss's system at the, uh, at the c uh, collector level. Okay, and... So to answer your question, I'm sorry, Mike, no, uh, October. Yeah, would yeah. be better. Yeah, but yeah. if you know you're going to abandon, or well, that's really the selectmen. It's not even your call, I guess. But suppose your recommendation is to not consider the uh, residential, but uh, the, the selectmen don't decide otherwise. Still, I would be looking for an October. And Pat had mentioned that in the beginning. Yeah. Um, a residential exemption uh, that needs to be applied for by the home by the homeowner, correct? Uh, initially, uh, we would identify many of them, and then there is an application process after that for those who don't. So, so you're saying that uh, probably the majority or vast majority of homes would automatically get that exemption based yeah. on the information you already have in your system. If you overlook somebody, they could come There's in, an fill process. out the paperwork, yeah. and and they would they would get the. That's not something. You, if they overpaid in the first quarter, they'd get the benefit they'd get of the it second back. quarter. Exactly right. It'd be handled just like somebody who's overvalued, if you will. Right. Yeah. And this, and the small commercial exemption, if somebody dispute, you know, they're not on they're not on the state list, and they don't they don't pop up on yours. If they come in after the fact and say we're in line for this, yeah. it's the same sort of thing. They need same to go thing. through the paperwork, but they would get the full benefit. Absolutely. Absolutely. What we, we would have to do is, um, in anticipation of at least some of that kind of activity. Um, Increase the overlay account to right. accommodate that, that. That's the other place that yeah. it has an influence. Okay. One more, and then a data request. Uh, with respect to the hardship exemption, the, uh, the the tax study from 2004 referred to this exemption as not widely used, which still seems to be the case. It, is, it, is still the it, case. it also refers to it as, uh, it quote says, as local assessors seem reluctant to be the arbiters of this rather nebulous standard, which makes perfect sense that you would be uncomfortable with that situation. My, my question is, is if the Board of Selectmen, if the senior elected officials in town were to establish a non-nebulous standard, some specific criteria, how difficult is it for you to actually implement, manage this exemption? I think the Board of Selectmen could make a recommendation to the Board of Assessors. Ultimately, it's the Board of Assessors who would decide who gets a hardship clause. Okay. That's, the, the, way, that's the way it is? Yep. Okay. Fair enough, thank you. Um, and then some of the other questions I had are answered by okay. this nice thing. Yep. Could, we, could, I, could we get the actual data file? Yes, I'm having trouble reading yep, it. Yep, yep, okay. yeah, it's a little tricky there. But, but thank you. Mm -hmm. All set? All set. Okay. All right. I, thank you very much. That's everything. Thank you. thank you, Frank. Although we may have some questions. Yeah, I have a question, <laughs> but I think, forward. I think it's for the next one. Yeah, okay. So the, the, next, the next thing on the agenda is just a review of the documents that we've received so far from Frank, and it's it's a rather long list. Um, unless somebody has a better idea, I think I'm just going to kind of go through them one by one, or maybe clump a couple together at times. Uh, the first one being that 2004 DOR study. This was this was something that went out in the original packet from Frank. Um, does anybody have particular questions about that, or are you looking for additional information related <coughs> to that? <coughs> Um, I'm just, <coughs> when do they do another study? I, that was a one-off that was, that was mandated by the legislature, M much like the foundation budget review or, or you know, some other kind of review that, they, that the state puts a committee together. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of anything in the pipeline 
okay. to look at this sort of thing again. All right, thank you. Uh, the small commercial exemption presentation we got from Frank, I, I'm inclined to hold that for a little bit until we have a chance to talk to the folks from Westford. I think maybe we, we might wind up spending an entire night just on that topic. Um, and so unless there's something pressing, I'd, I'd be inclined to hold that for now. Uh, the residential exemption worksheet, does anybody have questions about that? Do, we, do people feel like they pretty much understand how a residential exemption works? What, what needs to happen, or are there, is there additional detail that you'd like? Okay. Um, the process and methods uh, document, <coughs> this came out more recently, kind of a review of how assessments are done. This may be something we decide to go into more detail on, or I guess, or not, according to the inclination of the committee. Um, no immediate questions. Uh, there's a bunch of previous reports. Uh, I'm going to hold off on that for a minute. I'd like to address that last because I think there's some additional discussion around that. The, uh, the levy and value share history that was distributed, I think, late was it early last week? Um, that goes back to 1983, I believe. That's, mm -hmm. that's what the committee had asked for. Yeah. Um, I think it's a one-off and it, and it is complete. Um, the 129 vacancy and the 129 parcel profile, I think is a very in-depth look at a portion of the town. Um, and then you also got, I think, a, a multi-sheet uh, workbook in Excel, uh, the, vacan the multi-town vacancies which looks at Chelmsford and, and I think five other surrounding towns, um, just kind of looking at the, um, what, kind, what kind of space they have and how full it is. And that's, that's, the, that's the back end of the uh, paper clipped section that you have here, along with some definitions in the front. Does anybody have questions about that or, or say, thoughts? Well, yeah. The fact is, Mike, is you recall I sent the, the five tab, and it, when I really started to look at it, it was extremely lengthy and, and mm -hmm. cumbersome. So but some of it was, when you really looked at it, somewhat um, repetitive. It would show us a percentage, then the square footage, and there was no need for both. So what I did with all five communities is consolidate the thing into something a little more manageable. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. and uh, as as Frank expressed to me in an email, uh, he the the feeling is 2009 through 2017 is enough to look at kind of a business cycle and That's see right. some highs and lows and and get a sense of what are so you would think it's more or less a, a normal range. Yes, seven um, to ten years of what I would consider a real estate cycle. It had one other pick <laughs> that said um, all years, and I was too scared to crack that. <laughs> <up and so. laughs> Just. I, from my perspective, I feel like that could come up again is something I might. I, I think so, I, too. I looked at that, and I, this helps because now I know what, some of the, what it means, what d d the definition right. yeah. of vacant space. And, and there were some, place, some of the files, and mm -hmm. I appreciate them, but I've had a discussion about acronyms tonight, and I didn't know what, what, what did it mean or what did it mean in this file. And is FF square footage or single family in various places? So this will help look at that again. Yeah, it might be interesting to see uh, if, if there's some kind of correlation between the, the vacancy rates and the existence of a, a split rate or not. I did. Um, did you? And there was none. <laughs> OK. No, the the it, correlates. I mean, it's a, it's a very small data set. It is a very small data the, set. The the correlation to coefficient the coefficient uh -huh. the coefficient of correlation was 0.16. Okay, I mean that's the sort of thing. Maybe we maybe we want to go back and ask for a little bit more data. Um, maybe the same time period, but but some selected towns. Uh, these th I thought this is a nice group of towns, but if we look at the list of towns that have used classification or or the list of towns that have uh, had classification and then dropped it. Um, maybe maybe we maybe we want to look at a couple of those more particularly and expand the universe a little bit that way. I, I don't know if if you feel like it's not worth pursuing, then we don't need to make additional work. But um, looking at this kind of information, it might be worth pursuing. 
can I, I'm yeah. going to go back because we were talking about these vacancy rates, whatever. The one that has to do with Route 129, there's a column in there that says RBA. What does RBA stand for? Rentable, uh, rentable, I can't forget the acronym. Basically, it's the amount of space that could be rented. Okay. Thank the, you. The, building density. the other thing on the on the 129 information, you have uh, the space is classified as A, B, C. I can get you the exact definitions, and it has to do with the classes of the property, what class A property is, what class B property, and there's a very uh, uh, a paragraph worth of definitions of what what each of those include. That might be helpful. Okay, and then. Um, the last grouping would be the previous reports. Um, you have the 1995 final report. You have the 2004 TAC Classification Committee report and uh, the, the following year, 2005, Board of Selectmen Subcommittee report. Those, I think, are all worth looking at fairly closely, um, par partly to shed some light on what we want our report to look like. Um, I think one of the, looking at that, one of the things is that um, they largely, uh, they look at, they do business surveys. Um, I think that might be something we want to think about doing as well. Um, I think we might also want to do a residential survey if we're going to do a business survey so that we look at the, uh, the entire uh, people, a group of people. Um, the, the 1995 report had a set of defined questions that they asked other towns. I think that might be worth thinking about uh, for us as well. Um, I, I think we should try to reach out to some of these other towns that have, that have implemented classification and ask them about why they're doing it, how they're doing it, what they see when it happens. Um, but I, it would also be helpful, I think, if we want to split that work up a little bit, have a couple of different people be responsible for reaching out if we all had a, a set of standard questions to ask. Do you guys want to try to do that tonight? Do you want to take a week and think about it and come back with questions for next week? Would you like me to just put those questions on a separate piece of paper and we could, you know, split up the work at that time? At least we'll know what we're That's, we're that's okay with me, yeah. And I mean, if we, want to, if we want to tweak them, if we want to change them, right. that's fine. Can you put it? Can you put it on the computer? I know you don't have a computer, do you, Dan? What's what's that? You don't have a computer. Right? I have two. Oh, sorry. I don't know why I thought that. Can you put them on? Put them in a Word document, and send them to us, and then we can look at them and critique them, and then go from there. Well, I'm thinking if I get it printed out and we can just hand it out at the next meeting, then we could tweak okay. it during the meeting. Unless you want to do it some other way. I think that's fine, but uh, the sooner, if you can, if you can send it out, then people can think about it, and we'll probably be more I productive. That. I, I mean, that's that. my reservation with doing it tonight is we could I'll do spend that a lot of time. Next meeting. Okay, um, Dan, you indicated you had some questions or comments or a little of both. Um, I have a lung condition that makes me cough. If you haven't noticed, it comes and goes so. As long as I can talk without coughing, I will continue. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of simple questions. How do you get, or how, how does the assessors, and I may be stupid, I couldn't get it from your giant report that you gave us on June 4th. How do you get the 80-20 split? Uh, round numbers, whether it's 81, 19. But how do you get that split? I just want to make sure I'm going to mean that we have 80% of our base is residential, 20% is commercial, industrial, personal property? Yes. Simply by the valuations. On the residential side, 80% of our, we, we, have this, we have our use codes. Every property is, is given a use code. It basically has to fall into one of several classes, residential, Commercial, industrial, or personal property. Okay. Personal property is commercial. Residential stands. So you lump those together. We keep those. Yes, the commercial. You lump them together, and you end up with an eighty twenty. That's right. That the residential valuation wise, evaluation the, the town is worth about four point five billion dollars. Of that four point okay. five right. billion dollars, uh, three point billion, whatever the number is, 
is residential single family homes, multifamily homes, everything that's been identified, vacant land, vacant residential land, everything that's been identified as residential. Uh, roughly, uh, I think it's $300 million commercial. Roughly another three, $250 million um, industrial, another almost $200 million personal property. So when you lump the CIP together, obviously totals out at 100%, it's roughly an 80-20 split. Okay, I guess I wanted to hear you say it because that's, that's what I got from it. Yep. But it wasn't, it wasn't apparent. Okay. Um, number two, the, all of that tells me, I like to look at things simpler. All of that tells me almost no matter what you do, you can't improve the tax base to the residents without increasing the business side of the. That's correct. Because it doesn't make sense, quite frankly. I looked at three simple classification rates, and I'll call them 10%, 20%, and 50%. And as you push down on, as you, as you lower the residence tax on average, the business tax goes up dramatically. On average, mm -hmm. it's a zero sum game. What what would people like to see for a tax lowering? Here's a question for the residential yeah survey mm -hmm. survey. My opinion is probably different than a lot of people's. Um, my opinion would be in the ten percent. $161 doesn't do it. It's not enough. But that would raise the business side on aggregate almost $1,800. And it gets worse. Mm -hmm. The number I'd like to see is 20%. That means the average resident would save $323. I'm parroting your numbers with a, using a total, because I don't like looking at sheets like this that don't give me an answer. Not, not, and, I, and I don't mean that derogatory. No, no, I, I gave a, a, um, many, many scenarios there, going literally from um, splitting of 1% to the maximum of 50% yes. and what the impact would be. So I just picked out it's exactly some what of it was the for. stuff. It's exactly what it was for. But the 323 savings as a homeowner would drive the average, and I used a million dollars as the average uh, business, which may be a little high. Um, that would raise their taxes thirty six hundred, and I did this manually. I did it on an Excel spreadsheet. I looked at your numbers. I even did it to the nineteen ninety five tax report. But I didn't go any further than the 5%, which was in the 95 report. And for that, if you go to from, the, from the flat rate to the classification rate, the homeowner would have saved in 1995 $37, and the business would have gone up 500 now, if you start doubling those, those numbers, the business goes up dramatically. But I used, so I'm skipping back and forth, for the information I gave you first, I used the residential rate of an average of 400. That's pretty close to the... Sure is. You know, and I do it for convenience because it was in the book. And I used a million for the business. Now, I know there's a lot that aren't, and a lot that are more. A lot that are less, and a lot that are more. <clears throat> but I came away after reading the 1995 report, and I will not comment on the 2005, because the, the Board of Selectmen Committee 
really took that committee to task, the subcommittee. Um, I came away with, why are we doing all this? <laughs> well, now's a heck of a time to think about that. <laughs> Be careful what you volunteer for. <laughs> um, I really know the answer to that, but I was just, once I got into reading all that great stuff you sent me, us, um, I said, wow, we could write another 30 pages and, and, and go right around in a circle and be back where we are. The solution is more business. We can't build a thousand houses. We've already done that. But we can certainly build two or three hundred significant business properties and not just change what you have. You've got to build new ones, right? Both, effective, both are effective. New effective. growth is certainly a new terrific gro thing. New, new growth. Um, one of the things we talked about in the 129 committee. If, you're, if you renovate a building that Tim Posey built 30 years ago, that doesn't get you there. Unless you put, you know, make it five stories instead of three. True. But really the solution is more business. Now, having sh shot my mouth off about that, two weeks ago, I went to the economic development meeting. And they're doing exactly what I had hoped they would be doing. I'm just impatient, as I said at that meeting. <laughs> it's not happening quick enough. I understand why. So I, I think my perception today is a lot different than it was two weeks ago, where I accused the board of selecting all kinds of things. <laughs> Not doing anything was one of them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but it, but it really looks like they're on the right track. They got two people working on it instead of one, and they're going to have a monthly or every two months public relations message and I and I said at the meeting I'm now going to have to buy the independent but that's terrific yeah, they're doing good work and it's it's really starting to come around so I want to spend the rest of my <laughs> I, reading and understanding this, which may be very short, by the way. Um, yes, I do. I wouldn't have volunteered. Well, I think you bring up a good point. This is th there's a lot of data in that book. If you can find a way oh, to man. distill thirty pages down into a paragraph, that's what the report is going to be like, right? That's what we need to do. And um, and I looked and in looking out those old reports. Mm -hmm. They had mission statements by a former town manager that were absolutely wrong. They were two pages long. You don't do that. They were very long mission statements. I pulled out my mission statement for the uh, fire department ambulance committee, the grinder pump committee, and uh, I had another one, and they're all two, two, three sentences. Goals and objectives are objectives. Knock yourself out. So at least we got that right. So I got that. I got it's that. A, it's a start. But it certainly was. See, I don't. I went to school for engineering. I didn't go to school for, for English, <laughs> uh, obviously. Um, but I ought to love all these numbers. But there's too many numbers. 
God bless you. Good. Yeah. I, again, I, I please keep thinking about how to how to sh how to condense it, how to say it in a paragraph, like you just did. Did you have something? I think that was absolutely wonderful, Dean. Thank you. I do have the link to I think the meeting that you went to the economic development. Um, do they show the crossroad logo during that meeting? Well, it was a Middlesex three. Yeah, that's um, a, that's different than the local and right. economic development committee meeting. This is the committee well, here. Okay, so part of the Middlesex three, they they unveiled the, the Crossroads logo and then they went through all of the different processes that they're going through, which I thought was very enlightening. And I sent it to our neighborhood um, list, and nobody had a negative comment about it. It was sent to about 58 people, and you know. I mean, I could send it to you. I think it's really valuable to, to look at, certainly from certain minutes to other minutes. Extremely well done, and it just it, it clarified a lot in my mind as to what needs to happen. Um, so if you'd like me to send that to you, I can. I'd like it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right, I will. Good. Just a comment. I appreciate, Dan, what you, you talked about. I had that sort of revelation some years ago when I sat on the FinCom and Frank made a presentation on split tax rate and that. And I think that's important. The important question you brought up is what what is meaningful to people in terms of savings? Yeah. What, what, what is meaningful to people in, in terms of savings? Because, you know, $100 on your $7,000 tax bill, is that meaningful, you know, savings? No, and to then, some people that may be. It may, it may but be, to but most, I, I think most that's... most people, they could care less. And I think that's, if any, t to me, what, what has to come from, from here is sort of getting that point across to people, is that to achieve any kind of meaningful savings, you're just having to make a shift that's that's going to be this big increase on businesses and and that that discussion and i i just don't think that people realize they think oh let's do the split tax rate and save people some money but to realize that what it saves them is just a little bit relative to what what it does to business mm -hmm. is is a discussion to have and certainly i think that's one of the more important questions and i'm glad you stated it it's certainly something that um Changed my view a number of years ago on tax classification, on, on split tax rates, and it was important to me to look at it again. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, some of these things, I'm sure, some of these documents, I'm sure we will yeah. come back to uh, over time, but I just, there were a lot of them, and I just want to make sure that everybody had a chance. Uh, I had another question. Okay. What did I do with it? I can probably remember it. Couldn't remember Paul Cohen's name, but that's all right. Uh, it's for the assessors. Um, do you assess home occupation residents differently, additionally? I mean, every, every now and then somebody does it right and they go to the Board of Appeals and they get a permit. Or they go to the building inspector for a much simpler permit. Sticking to, with your question. To do work out of the house. Okay. <clears throat> I assume you're talking about running a business out of the home. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. Okay. Um, Home-based home businesses are get a personal property tax bill to the extent they have personal property, that it, which is a taxable business property as it relates to the business. So we would, they would get a, if they've gone through the proper channels as you have, have laid out, they would get a business property tax. Having said that, we implemented two, three years ago an exemption, <clears throat> an exemption for any personal property that's valuation identified, valuation, not tax dollars, $5,000 or less doesn't get a bill. The effect of which probably is to capture and eliminate home-based businesses, with some exceptions. Some uh, home-based businesses are probably pretty robust, robust, larger, serious concerns, and, and would still get a bill. So, okay. so to answer your question, there's nothing um, unless the house is somehow physically altered to accommodate the business. Then once again, we would get into that mixed-use component where they have a storefront or something <coughs> like that. 
because there used to be, and I would not, I wouldn't think it has changed. You could use up to 25% of your current floor space. And I would think that would be. That's the income tax. Right. The, what Frank has just said, the value, the value of the real estate. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. It's right. just the personal it, it, property. That's, that's the key word. Okay. Sorry, right. sorry. The, the it's it's still considered residential, right? Yes, it would. Yes. Okay, and the, uh, and so it's just a personal property, the P component. That that's right. If a relatively modest business, home-based business that we all know about, is being run out of there, they would. And they've gotten the DBA from the clerk's office and gone through the channels. There would be a personal property taxation potentially. Once again, unless it um, <coughs> falls below that five thousand dollar threshold, then they're exempt. Which we adopted that two, three years ago. For the express purpose of, of not so much capturing whole businesses or, and uh, giving them a rake, but what, my, what, the what the collector of taxes found himself doing is continually uh, finding that those smaller businesses are the ones going into default and is expending uh, personal time, not personal time, professional time and resources uh, chasing relatively smaller amounts of, uh, of money. So this eliminated that. That's why we have no enforcement. <laughs> Okay, uh, next thing, committee member presentations and general questions. Um, we have a, uh, several handouts. Uh, let's start with the big one from John. And John, do you wanna talk about what this is? And uh, the first three pages is just a completion of what I s passed out last time with the uh, Census Bureau and Mass Department of Revenue and Register of Deeds information about the 33 communities that are part of our <coughs> study. Uh, the next page, or the next two pages, front and back, um, show the residential and commercial ranks uh, with the obvious caveat that you can't tell everything by just looking at the tax rate, but what this data does show is how our ranking would change with various splits in terms of where our residential tax rate, commercial tax rate falls among the 33 communities. And then the last page, the communities adopting or dropping is, is kind of at this point redundant with the handout that you. I, they're, they're pretty much, they, they cover most, the, the same kind of information just presented slightly differently. Uh, one of the questions we were asked by the selectmen was to uh, tell them what, what initial rate had been adopted by other comparable communities. Uh, as John pointed out last time, the only comparable community out of the 33 that were proposed, the, the circles you'll recall, uh, was Lincoln. Um, and uh, that, that initial rate was 1.15. If you go through um, the DOR uh, information, you can find a number of other communities that have uh, added, and in some cases added and subtracted split rates uh, from their towns. Um, so you can, you've got a list on, on, on both of the sheets, um, both John's and, and mine, uh, showing the different towns that adopted them, um, the initial rates, and uh, then um, I included the current or the final rate. Uh, sorry, this is the single sheet now uh, that compares to, to the last sheet in John's packet. Um, so for the, 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 that upper set of towns, the, the, the current rate is the rate that they're actually using right now for the split. And you can see in, in virtually every case, uh, well, I guess Dartmouth might be an exception, uh, they started much lower than their final, than their final rate. Um, so it seems that uh, one of the things that we'll be putting in our report is that even if the decision is made to adopt a split rate, uh, it looks like most other towns that have done this have kind of stepped it up gradually to, to minimize any kind of disruption. And if you look at the, if you look at the data, you'll see, and, and even this is true even in Chelmsford's case, that, um, they all, that towns that discontinue a split rate also do it somewhat gradually. So I think one of the things for the, for the selectmen to think about is that a commitment to a split rate is not kind of a, a light switch sort of thing. It's more like getting getting the shower temperature right. <laughs> you, you gotta you gotta be careful, you gotta you you've gotta kinda fine tune it and you and you wanna keep checking, you wanna make sure. But understand that that even if you're gonna 
if you're going to walk it up and decide it's not working, you're, you're still going to have to walk it down. So it's a, it's a multi-year commitment, really, to, to do it, I think, in, a, in the way that most of these other towns have done it. Um, and then, yeah, I think some of the talking about who we want to talk to, uh, some of these other towns, uh, Lincoln obviously is one, but it might be instructive to talk to some of the towns who put in a split rate and then discontinued it as well mm -hmm. uh, to see if, if that was simply a, a shift in the political winds or if they saw something that, and that you know, an impact on the business community that was problematic. Um, again, I want to, I, I, I don't think we're, I, I don't think it's this committee's job to tell the selectmen yes or no. I think it's uh, what they asked for from us mm -hmm. was to prepare them for, for that kind of, uh, how do you make that kind of a change in an effective way? Or what, what should you be thinking about when you consider that question every year? And so I, I think there'll, if, if other towns have gone to split rates and found them problematic, I think one of the things we should be telling the selectmen about is what kind of problems to look out for. Uh, so hopefully if, you know, even if it goes well for a while, you need to be looking at, at these sort of things every year to make sure things aren't getting out of hand. Um, I ask John, John a question on your on this. You have a high to low ranking that's based on tax rate. Yes. Okay. The, which the, which the again mill. doesn't tell you everything. It doesn't tell you. Yeah, it doesn't tell you anything really. Well, well, you, in and of itself, no. This this is simply showing what where we would rank. So it gives you a sense for how we would how, how much a, a shift to say 1.1 would change where we are within the 33 communities. Okay, I, I have to think about how that because I mean when you when we're looking at, at numbers and where we rank, you're usually talking about average tax bill, which is that combination of the average assessment with mm -hmm. the with the rate and yeah. not just just the rate. I, I, okay. Agreed. Uh, the mill rate gets looked at though a lot too. I think that's the that's the the one where we're well, 69th or something and uh, no, it, we're, that's it's average tax bill. What's what, what, what Paul oh, presents okay, okay. and talks about is average tax bill. Okay, and it's it's why it's it's that combination sure. that that determines your your tax bill and that makes a difference. And anybody that comes to me and quotes. You know, well, uh, the rate is cheaper, such and such and whatever. Well, you know, look at Carlisle. The rate is cheaper, but the values are, are enormous. really high. Mm -hmm. Are enormous. So your yes. average tax bill is going to be a whole lot higher in those. I mean, you know, so if. Well, you could probably figure that fairly quickly, right? If you just multiply that mill rate by the median value of the owner-occupied units yeah. that you have on the first page. And that's I, I mean it doesn't I just was wanted to check as to what his his ranking was on here and that's mm -hmm. I think I think that's an interesting perspective and and in some ways it goes to Dan's point about how big a change do you need to make to have a really noticeable influence yeah. I mean you can see if you go to a 1.1 we go from seventh to eighth <laughs> that's not that's not much of a change yeah. you have to go farther than that before you start to see a, a big drop in our in our ranking yeah. but yeah it might be good to see what the overall bill looks like too with that kind of calculation you know something that interested me when Frank presented us with um, the the chart that went back more years yeah. on value and whatever is our ranking we ranked higher on the average tax bill back at the time when we had a 5% shift I mean, I think that would surprise people. We had a 5% shift, and yet I, it, it's difficult to tell what year, but this was, I mean, this is a long, quite a few years ago. We're talking 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, but we were, we were ranking in the 40s, 40th high, 40-something 40 high tax bill as opposed to. One of the reasons that may have been at the time was that was about the time that we were implementing the SOAR. And the SOAR debt might have been hitting the levy right around that same time frame. So the, the overall levy was increasing. Okay. I'm, I'm just. It, it may uh, be. Yeah, I think, in fact, the 95 report right. talks about that In fact, that was one of the reasons explicitly. that the split was um, implemented, was right. to try to mitigate, to some extent, the cost of, uh, of the sort to effectively put it onto the commercial industrial, to some extent. And then, as you can see, it comes down, as Mike was alluding to, a little bit at a time until you settle into a, uh, a unified tax rate. I don't know how long we had it all together, six or eight years or something. The split tax rate? Split, two, four, six, eight... 
nine years at nine five years. percent, and then another three years Total? where it okay. was being reduced. Right. Yeah. Well, again, if you know, Paul talks about a grand bargain. If there's going to be if there's going to be a debt exemption or an override, and this is used to mitigate that, once again, I think uh, it might it, it might be worth considering that it would not be a one or a two year fix, but it'd take a little bit longer to kind of roll up and roll back down. Um, in addition to those, um, you also have a couple of hard to read charts from me uh, that are the uh, total and average amounts of exemptions claimed in Chelmsford. Um, and I believe also, so there, there should be, yeah, it's a single sided, um, and, and it includes the senior. Uh, circuit the breaker. senior circuit breaker, oh, which is. yeah. So on the one uh, here, Colleen has a couple has a couple extra versions. Um, this is, and I'll I'll distribute these two to everybody. Um, this is just the exemptions alone without the senior circuit breaker. And then if you go to the second one there, Colleen, you you can see how <laughs> everything just flattens and compresses. The senior cir senior circuit breaker is far more important uh, as a method of tax relief than than the exemptions are. Um, it just, the amount there is, it just kind of dominates what's claimed by the exemptions. Um, if you look at though the averages, that's not true. Um, and Colleen, if you go to the next one, <coughs> you can see there are kind of two categories there of, of exemptions, this is average exemption. So, so the the prior, the first chart is just the total amount of exemptions granted. This is the number. This is the total amount divided by the number of people collecting them. And you can see all those flat lines down on the bottom. Those are things that the the eligible amount hasn't been increased for years. Um, some of the others float a little bit more and are more or less keeping up with, or uh, I don't know if they're really keeping up, I didn't put a deflator on there, but uh, they're at least increasing over time. <coughs> <coughs> it's just a graphical representation of, of, some, of the, uh, of some of the data that, uh, you know, I don't know if I got that from you or from DOR. It might have been on. It might have been at DOR. You did. You did have some information about exemptions, but. I will. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, anybody else? Questions? Comments? This is kind of the unstructured time. If you have things you want to put on the agenda for next time, if. If you think there's things we should be pursuing, no. But as long as we've got the open time, I have a question. You know, <coughs> asked Frank, and and Dan made reference to the 2004 report that we looked at, and then the follow-up 2005 that was the critique on the 2004 four recommendations, which talked. Their conclusion was that. Part of the problem was that the commercial properties weren't being valued at, at the levels compared <coughs> to sale price. Has any of that changed in over time, or is it? Do all of those um, their comments and all of the the comments in retort still apply? It's been a few years since I've read those reports, but what the 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 the, the Camaris report basically felt. And Sam can probably expand on this better than I can. <coughs> the way commercial properties are valued is inherently flawed. That the sales approach, or what they call the retail approach or the sales approach for residential properties, that that was clear to them that that was the better way to look at, at, at establishing valuations. We almost always have plenty of sales of single family homes, condominiums throughout the town, as do most communities. But when you get into the area, so establishing the values for those is pretty straightforward. When you get into the commercial stuff, the commercial industrial stuff, there are sometimes only a handful of sales. Uh, even those uh, would have to have huge adjustments made 
Uh, so they were, many of those are not necessarily useful in, in establishing what the assessment is, should be. So we defer to the, uh, the income approach to valuation. And in the income approach to valuation, there are certain um, assumptions made. And I think that the committee found that some, of the, some assumptions were made, are, are made when valuing a property through the income approach that might make it um, subjective. And it's, it's somewhat inherent, I'm kind of paraphrasing their the position on this. It's somewhat uh, flawed. Um, is that fairly, fairly accurate representation? Um, that's a very accurate representation as to what the Camaris Committee thought. Yeah. Not the way it really is. Well, I... I okay. The just, 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 to, just to be clear, okay, uh, what the Camaris Committee said, <clears throat> they said that, uh, they said a number of things. They said that uh, the right way to value real estate is the sales method, period. That's the right way to do it, whether it's residential or commercial. The, w the correct way is the sales method because that is the most accurate method, regardless of whether it's commercial property or residential. That's what they said. The problem is that's not right. That's wrong. It's, that's not an accurate statement. Okay. The truth of the matter is that you, use, you always use more than one method to value property, whether it's residential or commercial. Okay. The state requires that you use two methods to value residential property. They require that you use two methods to value commercial property, and in the case of commercial property, you almost always use all three methods. So the Camaris Committee premises were wrong. They were not accurate, okay? That's, that's the first thing. So um, the Camaris Committee further uh, went on to say that as a result of their uh, analysis that usually commercial properties in Chelmsford and in other communities are undervalued by 40% with respect to their true market value. They came to that conclusion. That is also wrong. What, what is not understood and what was not understood by, by the 2004 Tax Classification Committee is that the work of the assessor is scrutinized every year by the Bureau of Local Assessments and the Department of Revenue. These people are professionals. They're lawyers that have backgrounds in real estate appraisal and assessment. They know what they're doing. The assessors send in the recap sheet every year as to the values. The state looks at it every year and they have to certify that your values are accurate with respect to the market standard. Under that system, it is not possible for a town year over year to be 40% off on any class valuation. It just is not possible. So that was their conclusion, okay? Um, the 2005 report uh, looked into these matters in depth and basically concluded what I've just said, that the assessments are not 40% below market standard year over year, which is what the 2004 committee used as a reason for adopting a split rate. The 2005 committee went on to say, <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, uh, that report was uh, very often mischaracterized in the public discourse. People have said uh, that the 2005 report recommended against adopting a split rate. Well, you have the report in front of you. Read the last two pages. It doesn't do anything of the kind. It says, these are the reasons that you may want to use for adopting a split rate, and the selectmen need to look at them every year, consider the current data, and make a decision. But one of those criteria is not that the commercial properties are valued 40% below market standard. That just is not true isn't accurate. Have I answered your question? Well, yeah, I, I, I guess the thing is, I, 
<clears throat> had the impression they were basing that conclusion on a one or two sales that they saw that were forty percent. You know, that were the forty percent difference. They I'm just they made. If they, over well, time I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what they did. They made the assumption. They made the assumption that a recent sales price of a commercial property is or ought to be its assessed value. Yeah. And as Frank just told you, uh, one of the reasons that sales of commercial properties very often are not accurate predictors of market value is because the sale of a commercial property very often includes things of value other than the real estate. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> A lot of commercial properties are bought on what they call a lease fee basis. So you might have a commercial property that's rented out to various uh, tenants and so forth. And let's say that the going market rate uh, for the lease, uh, for, for, for lease properties in that particular geographic region is $25 a square foot. But for some reason, this building that just sold has a, has a lease basis of $40 a square foot because the lease was concluded six years prior when lease values were higher. Well, the standard for valuing property, uh, commercial property, uh, on, a, on an income basis is that you can consider the lease as reflective of the value of the real estate if it reflects current market value. If it's an older lease that has substantially higher market value, you can't use that as a basis for the value of the real estate. So what, what I think the committee did do is they looked at some of these, <clears throat> these buildings that had the high lease values and the, they uh, had recent sales where the buyer bought the value of the high, mar of the high lease above the market. And they said, well, <clears throat> the assessor's got the, got the building uh, at eight, eight million, but this guy just bought the thing six months ago for 12 million, so the assessor is wrong. Well, no, the assessor is right, because the assessor, by law, has to value the real estate, not the value of the lease. Does that make sense? No, it, it does. Okay. Uh, and I was just wondering. That, that's the that's the mistake they made. They they looked they looked at a universe of properties in Chelmsford, commercial properties in Chelmsford, and they they looked at all of the uh, uh, values. In fact, I think they even went up on the Vision Appraisal uh, database, and they saw that the sales were all qualified, but they didn't know what qualified meant. You can qualify the sale in terms of a lease sale or a fee simple sale. They didn't know the difference. So they just assumed that if the building showed on the vision database at 12 million and the letter Q was next to it, that was an accurate market valuation. And it isn't because you have to go in and as Frank said, for a commercial property, you've got to examine the sale and find out what did the guy who bought the commercial property buy? Did he buy just the value of the real estate, or did he buy a lease? Did he buy customer goodwill? Did he buy chattel equipment that went with the property sale? You have to, and you have to subtract all of that out because under state law, you can only be taxed on the value of the real estate, not anything else that's included in the sale. And that's where they, that's where they got off the track on their report. So you're saying too that the the purchase price might have included some of the personal property. It usually that was does. In there. Yeah. It usually does. Very very seldom. And Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, but on the on the larger commercial properties, the office suites and so forth, that have lease value attached, it's unusual that the sale will only be the fee simple value, the value just of the real estate. It almost always includes other things, and you can't by law tax people on things that aren't real estate. Property tax you can't do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, before you. Yeah, please. If you. Have you're doing such a good job on commercial. Explain how you come up with a amount on residential. You is mean the, the value of the sale of the houses, or is there something else in? Well, I'm going to I'm going to speak for about five seconds, and then I'm going to have Frank come up because he's the guy that actually does that. But basically, like I said. If you look at your property tax bill, which I'm sure you have, yeah, <clears throat> you're, going to see, you're going to see two values listed. It doesn't just say the value of your property and house together. 
you see a value for the building and you see a value for the land, right? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> if the only thing the assessor did was look at sales and take averages, how does he get the value of the building separate from the land? How does he do that? I don't know that's oh, Okay, well, that's, that's, that's my point. The point is he has to do something other than look at sales, okay, because you have two separate values. So now I'm going to turn it over to Frank and have him explain. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, with respect to coming up with residential valuations, um, it's an assessment sale ratio. So one of the first things we want to do is come up with, with a land value. Uh, the obvious quick way is do we have any land sales and frequently we do have land sales and they would be examined and qualified and ultimately an analyzed. But failing that, we do it, um, a, an allocation. So we take the, the sale price of a property, we subtract from that sale price the building value that we're carrying on the property which leaves an indicated land value and then we compare that to the assessed value that we're carrying for the property and, and make a uh, perform an analysis on that. And that gives us a sense of what land values are doing throughout the town. Um, building values, as Sam um, kind of alluded to, are uh, cost per square foot used from um, cost indicators, Marshall and Swift most notably, uh, and they're kind of the gold standard for coming up with this kind of information. And uh, ultimately we back off for depreciation. Uh, that's kind of the cost approach. And then we take a look at the sales. We simply take the assessed value of a property and divide it by the sale price of the property. That, and we array them, we'll sort them all high to low and find the median, the exact middle point, which was uh, discussed at, at length in the um, handout I gave you. I know Mike asked for a brief one page to be included, and I said, okay, I'll take care of you. That's the brief version. <laughs> that's, that's the okay. brief version. Uh, and then we perform an, an analysis on that. We've, we establish the median. And this is where the DOI gets involved in terms of establishing the guidelines. What they want to see in the, um, in the dominant class, which is residential, being 80%, and they want to see within the residential class, in this case, what, uh, what's the dominant ratio. They want to see between 90 and 110 on a median basis. Suppose I'm sitting at, as I am right now, frankly, at an 84 and 85, given the sales I'm looking at. That's clear to me. I've got to go up. Five, seven, eight percent overall, maybe more, maybe more in some areas. So we look at it that way, and then we break it out. We look break it out by style of home. There's about six or seven different styles of home: Cape, Colonial, Ranch, Conventional, Raised Ranch, all of it. And all of those ratios have to be within five percent of the overall dominant class median of 95. So we look at it by style of home, size of the home, age of the home. Location within town, we have each, each, every area is sort of stratified, what we call a site index, essentially accounting for neighborhoods, <coughs> the greater values for certain pockets in town. Each one of those site indexes have to fall, once again, within 5% of the overall. Then we take it by, by lot size, we break that up about seven different ways and make sure that larger tracts of land are not being uh, disproportionately assessed to smaller lots. Same thing with size of home. Make sure that smaller homes aren't being disproportionately assessed. We also do a quartile. Make sure we break it up into four even um, count distributions. Make sure that lower price properties, ones falling into lower, are not being assessed at a greater rate than higher ones on a, on a proportional basis. Um, that's as concise as I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was interesting though. It was very interesting. Sure. Yeah, that absolutely. We, we have one of the best, if not the best, assessor in the state. I just want you to know that. Well, I don't okay. know why he's. Uh, All right. He's uh, phenomenal. Exactly. I, yes. The answers my, that he's that's, been giving me, the questions yeah. I ask are. That's my point. Yes, so it's good. I'm, I'm very glad. I'm very glad you've asked these questions because it's 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 important. And as and as Sheila <clears throat> mentioned earlier. It's important for the residents to understand that this is not an arbitrary process. And I think, you know, in speaking with residents, so I've been on the board now for 10 years, and in speaking with residents, that's what I get from residents. Here I am. Yeah. They think, oh, well, they just, you know, they look at a sale here, or they look yeah. at the last sale price, and that's, you know, people have all kinds of impressions as to how this is done. This is a very formulaic, legally driven process. Yes, there is some subjectivity built into it, but mostly it's, it's pretty cut and dry, and uh, the assessors have to know what they're doing, and they have to apply standard appraisal 
and uh, assessment science techniques to the process. So I, I think you've got a pretty good flavor of that this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, you had a comment. Yeah. From, 19, from 2016 to 17, my taxes went up 8.7 percent. What was what were those years again, Dan? 16 to 17. 16 to 17. 8.7. 17 to 18, they went up 2%. Good deal. From 16 to 18, <laughs> I didn't do anything. You mean you didn't do anything to your property? That's what you're saying? I'm sorry. I didn't do anything. Okay. Right. Without having your data right in front of me, and this is a... Would you like it? No, 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 no. I believe you, Dan. <laughs> I think I can answer the can answer generally and probably address yours specifically at the same time because I get this question fairly often. Why is it under the, uh, with the guidelines of Prop 2 and a half, is it, is it my property? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Feel free to field that question for yourself. Then. Would I know the answer to the two and a half. I don't, I don't think about two and a half. Okay. That's the total. That's the aggregate. That's exactly right. So once again, as, as I alluded to, once we've been doing all of this analysis, what it's going to tell us is that different pockets of town, different styles of home are going to appreciate, remain flat, or decrease in varying amounts. Um, we could have a house that's a, a colonial, 2,000 square foot in one area that's going to be slightly different than 2,000 in another area because it's uh, in a different pocket of town with different um, size lot and different grades of property. We also look at it by the quality of the construction. Uh, so you are going to see fluctuations in your assessment each year. Um, almost never will it be an exact 2.5%. There will be some years that it's flat, some a little more than others. Do you want to mention the measurement list? Um, I don't know if I addressed that before, but a couple of years ago, Pat may remember, when we, um, we approached town meeting uh, to raise funds to do a complete measuring list of the town. Uh, that was done a couple of years ago. Uh, what that essentially was, I'm sure everybody got a visit, um, canvassing the entire town, one end of town to the other end of town, to do a complete measure and list of the property of all descriptive real estate. And that was just to make sure that the data was accurate. Uh, that's a state mandate. Uh, what they mandated was that each property, and have always mandated, that each property be visited once every nine years. Uh, a couple of years ago, they noticed there was some older dates hanging out there. Uh, we kept up with it pretty well, but they could see that it wasn't necessarily going to be addressed anytime soon. So they mandated that we do that in, in uh, good enough town meetings are fit to uh, appropriate the funds and we were able to get it done. And the fellow came to my house and he was well received. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I held my breath. In spite of what I may think. <laughs> and when this happens, I just go on the website, I check my neighbors' values, and I check Mr. Mr. Chase's? Chase's. Well, under his instructions, I've kept his artificially and his high, so he'll be above the same as mine, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> 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 oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime you go there and you, and you really want to confirm some other data, uh, call my office and I can send a record card to you that has even more data, and it's much more current. I got more data than I need. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, does that indicate that they sold houses in my neighborhood so because they part, did. There were quite a few sales in my neighborhood. Yes, uh, if you go to the website, our website, and I sort of want to keep, if we update the our website too frequently, what it begins to carry with it are, are, is a current, what we call a working value. And I prefer that a committed value only be on the website at any given time. So it may not have, what I'm trying to spit out, it may not have the most legal information, which shows uh, chain of ownership transfers and that sort of thing. Um, anytime I can provide any, any data you want in terms of our, our recent sales, either in your area okay. or town-wide. Yep. Thank you. I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. If there aren't any other pressing items of business here, we'll move along to uh, the one item under old business, which is upcoming meeting dates. Um, I reached out to uh, Chelmsford Telemedia and uh, Villo got back to me um, about other potential days. Uh, according to him, Tuesdays would be much better than Wednesdays or Thursdays. The only, comp the only competition we'd have would be the school committee meetings. 
but he wrote, uh, since they happen in different locations, both can be broadcast live. In that situation, it would just be that the school committee would be put on the educational channel instead of the, instead of the government channel. Um, there, are, uh, there are hard conflicts on Wednesdays and Thursdays here. Um, so as we discussed a little bit last time, Mondays are not good once we get to September. Um, and, uh, and now I think we're, we're, on, we're gonna move that presentation date a little farther forward, um, probably before town meeting. <laughs> if the rec I mean, like we'll see how it first. goes, but if the recommendation is that the, that the, that the Board of Selectmen should be considering this decision first Monday after town meeting, we've got to put it in their laps before town meeting starts yeah, that, so that they can that get it. October 1st. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I think we should, we should seriously consider moving these meetings to Tuesdays. Does anybody have a hard conflict on Tuesdays? Not generally. Let's see what's on TV. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we will be if we make the move. So, <laughs> meet, meet weekly. So, at, at least for the foreseeable okay. future, okay. right? Because I just I think we have so many things that I, we I, need I'm to. Not, I'm not disputing. I'm, I was just looking. We were on, on Mondays. We were almost weekly. Almost weekly through the middle of August. Right. In fact, it turns out that the school committee is um, only going to have one meeting during July and August, so there won't even be very many conflicts with them. Um, that, that would open up, I mean, if we make the move now, then it just clears everybody's schedules because I think we're gonna have to go to Tuesdays once we get to September or we're just not gonna have any time to meet. Um, so all things being equal, I'd just as soon go ahead and start scheduling on Tuesdays unless somebody has a serious but objection. Tomorrow. But not tomorrow. <laughs> no, Dan's gonna be at the dunk tank tomorrow. Oh, awesome. <laughs> we'll start next week. Well, I think the 10th, yeah. So um, that, would be, that would be uh, July 10th, July 17th, July 24th, and the 31st, August 7 and 14th. August 21st is the Tuesday that the school committee meets. We could maybe take that one off, depending on, on how things look at that point. Um, and then the, the, just the rest of the Tuesdays through the end of September, that leaves, you know, that's, that's only 13 meetings if we use every, each and every one of them before October 1st. If, our, so if, if we're looking at the delivery date of October 1st, Okay. Are you going to send this out? I will. I will send that out. Um, does has anybody reached out to other potential pre presenters? Um, fi finance committee mm -hmm. and um, Jim Clancy, who's the chair of the finance committee, suggested that instead of an attorney versed in tax law, possibly um, they could have um, somebody better s suited to speak. Uh, with a CPA, you know, basically a CPA or a tax mm -hmm. preparer. Yeah. Um, to discuss the actual impact. I think that might on the filers, residential and commercial. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. Did he have somebody in mind? Um, yes, there's a person on the committee, so he's speaking to her. Okay, so great. I should have her uh, in Fantastic. by next meeting. Chairman um, said housing authority agreed, but it will not be in July. That's fine. Um, I, I think having somebody here is always a little more expansive than a written report. But if they'd prefer to do a written report, we could. But yeah, if they're willing to come, I think I think we should talk to them. Okay. And and actually, that's not such a bad thing. I think if we work between now and then on kind of getting a, a better understanding of how the residential exemption might work, things like that, I think we'll be able to ask better questions. Uh, about how this might affect lower income folks. As you said, you know, a hundred bucks, that's, that's not even coffee. But, but for some people it is. 
Just I probably should clarify that to make it clear, the Chelmsford Housing Authority has made it clear that they will not be taking any positions on any I think I think that's wise, and I, I mean, I would not expect any anybody really to, to take a position in front of us, right? The, the place to take a position is in front of the selectmen, um, but I do want to make sure we're not missing anything in our report. Okay. Do you have a question about the... Um the open session that we want to have for the town? We talked yes. about September, but I, I don't know if we still want to do it in September or move it up. Um, you know, we could we could probably do it at the end of August. Um, most of the people will be home. You know, once the, sp once the sports stuff starts at the high school, people are back the last couple of weeks of August, uh, that age groups. The, the families with small children might still be away, but... The elderly might still be away. Will they? Mm-hmm. Until Labor Day. Until you, you hit September. Okay. I, I just it just occurred to me as we talked about um, Tuesday nights, there is an election day in September on a Tuesday. September so fourth. Right. September we wouldn't be allowed to meet that day. September, right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, uh, we probably wouldn't be meeting that. Let day. me see that. Oh, and the third is Labor Day, so we can't move to that yeah. Wednesday. You know what? If we, then you know, if we need to skip a week, that's that's a week just, to skip. Yeah. Yeah. It just. Yeah. No, I'm long. I'm glad you thought of it. I I, I kind of looked at the schedule, but I I didn't see that. Yeah. I, when we were talking, I, I was thinking. Well, I was gee, thinking we won't November, have to worry. So no worries, well, we right? won't have but, to worry about a Monday holiday right. with Labor Day, but. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Some. Ah, uh, public comments. Is there is there anyone here who'd like to address <coughs> the committee at this time? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll move on to action items. Uh, a quick review from the minutes. Um, the uh, objective statement and outline of report, I think, is still a, a future item, and I think we'll we'll go for that next time. Uh, so if you can get that. Sheila, you'll put the list out. Yes, right I will. Uh, of the of the old questions, and we'll we'll incorporate that under kind of a larger heading of what do we want this report to look like. So I would encourage people to think about what kind of um, sections you want. Also, a list of objectives is a good way to start generating what sections you want to see. Um, for me, can we televise on Tuesdays? Yes, I think that's taken care of. Uh, Frank, there was a request for a short overview of how you evaluate properties as well as some historic data. That's been delivered. That's done. Um, the EDC, I have not talked to the Economic Development Committee yet. Um, I, will, I will do that for the next meeting. The um, commercial or residential real estate broker, there was a suggestion that if any, that we might reach out to somebody to come and talk. But perhaps. I think upon review, I'd, I'd rather rely on the assessor's office to, to talk say, about that. Um, kind of implications of, yeah. of, of what that would, uh, of what changes would look like. Um, I think he does if, a great job. If, if so, you know, if, if you know somebody, I, I guess we can consider it. But we had, there was a discussion early on about kind of facts versus opinions. Um, and while a, a you know a, a good real estate broker certainly is an informed opinion, uh, that might be an argument better left to be made to the selectmen directly, since they're they're really the ones charged with considering that. Um, Tom was going to reach out to folks he knew in Lemonster and Fitchburg, and we'll continue that. Um, there's a request to Frank about somebody from the DOR to talk about changes. That came up again, too. Yeah. Is, if, there's, if, um, if there's not any significant changes, then maybe that's the answer. Then, well, and we'll reach out to the, to the people yeah. who drafted that deal for, <coughs> which is in the packet. Um, see if I can find the authors of that and see if they yeah. want to expand on that. They may want to, maybe, maybe something written from them. Uh, I don't know how quick they'll be to, to want to come out, but I'll certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, if, if there's nothing that's been done, so I, I guess there, there were some changes. Uh, one of you mentioned that the, that, that 2004 <coughs> report from Chelmsford indicated so, some recommendations for changes at the state level, some of which were, were implemented. Some were. Some of them were, were discussed tonight with the, um, 
the exemptions, the personal exemptions. Some yeah. of them were enacted. Some were, I've never heard of um, anything <coughs> happening with them. I'll review those again. Um, having more to do with, you know, exemptions or pro providing relief without doing a split tax rate is sort of what they were alluding to. Yeah. Again, I think a written statement from yeah. DOR saying these are the significant changes That's since right. 2004 would be great, and, and we don't need any more than that. That'd be fine. All right, uh, John, you reached out to CHA. Sheila, you reached out to FinCom, um, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Yes. Hopefully, we'll have somebody. Um, John has kept the reports coming. <laughs> That's good. Uh, we've done the uh, compare and contrast the adoption and abandonment of split rates, along with a, a calculation of the. Uh, the median and mean values, although, as John pointed out, I need to modify. I, I didn't include Long Meadow in my final number, so I'll update that. Um, Frank has provided us a, a fairly in-depth uh, look at the commercial vacancy rates um, and the EDC report. I'm not sure which report that was that we were looking for. There's a, there, there was a, yeah, there was a 2016 presentation to the selectmen uh, on the, on development at the one, in the 129 corridor. And um, Evan actually sent that to me today. Um, I, I can, I will distribute that to everybody as well. Um, I don't know that it's directly on point, but I think it, it goes to the question of is something being done that that might you know shed some light or have some bearing on whether or not there's a need for classification um, uh, Paul Cohn has been invited and has accepted and has come and spoken with us so that was a successful item uh, from tonight I just have a couple of things um, Frank we were asking you to get uh, maybe five years worth of data on the senior work off uh, amounts um, Sheila, you're going to put together a, question, a list of questions for other towns, and, and everybody will think about those and, and objectives and what the report looks like. Um, and I will send out an updated version of that chart so that you can actually get a look at the data a little bit more clearly. Anything else? Oh. I'd like to point out that if there are no press questions, you're going to come amazingly close <laughs> on the adjournment time. I may just, I may have to stall for just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, as John has pointed out, there do not seem to be any press questions tonight, uh, so I would entertain. I will, then, a, I will move to adjourn. <laughs> is there a second? I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Unanimous.